the magistracy uh, being able to hear some of these cases in an expeditious way. And that is of concern to us in the age out of the juvenile system and they have no system, their case has not been heard, they can be moved to the adult system as I explained yesterday. These are challenges that we have to overcome. And when we come to the issue of the judiciary, in terms of how we're trying to reduce the pretrial detentions, in addition to what we said yesterday, the number of courts that are, are built to be able to, there are approximately 13 ongoing projects to build new courts across all regions. Another approximately 12 ongoing projects to re rehabilitate existing courts. All regions will have courts and their necessary facilities, including living quarters for the magistrates and or judges that are attending. But we do wish to answer in relation to indigenous people, that in particular with region nine, the Rupununi, that there is a court in Lethem, the administrative center, as well as in regards to a traveling court to Aishalton, another major area in Region 9. Uh, there are new courts that have been built in Bartica, for example, and in, in Region 1 that have allowed for the first time for persons to have their cases heard in their, in their regions, um, whereas before they were uh, uh, judges or magistrates going once a quarter, once every three months, etc to hear cases. So it has made a fundamental change in the cases being heard in the areas, um, reducing the time and the cost to persons who have been charged and who have to appear in court. So this is not just uh, persons who are in detention, but persons who have other cases before the court. On the questions of child labor <clears throat> and trafficking in persons, it was a specific question asked <clears throat> about the 2019-2025 drafting process of the action plan on child labor. We annually report to the U.S. State Department on their, their issues regarding uh, child worst forms of child labor and TIPS. And the drafting process began in 2019 when we got into government in 2020. The Ministry of Labor held other consultations, which ministries do. They hold their own consultations with relevant agencies to deal with child labor and the plan. And the plan went through some uh, minor changes and it was launched. The issue of children uh, uh, working in dangerous jobs, manufacturing, mining, um, in farming. Again, we would be interested to hear these reports because we have, in fact, our, yeah. the, all the, the, the Ministry of Labor Inspectorate, the inspectorate of the different um, work sites of Ghana, where they go and review several thousand every year, that children in Ghana, we have uh, in the primary school level, we have 100% universal adult suffrage. Children attend school. In child labor, our laws that you have to attend school up to the age of 15. So that after 15, you can be employed. Although, as I reported in my initial presentation, that we are aiming for universal secondary education by 2025. So at this point, over 80% um, uh, children are in school on a daily basis. However, so our information is that a lot of children who are working in family businesses, whether it's helping in the farm, the home, etc. But we're not aware of any children in manufacturing nor in mining. That is prohibited and the mining offices have to remove children from any mining operation. This is not allowed. So that we would be interested in knowing any specific cases that is referred to. However, in, in, we'd like to report and, and refer to the UNICEF 2019-2020 mix, this is a multi-indicator cluster survey, revealed a strong decline in the prevalence of child labor across all of Guyana's regions. 
The average percentage of children aged 5 to 17 involved in, involved in child labor declined from 18.3% in 2014 to 6.4% in 2019, with 4.9% of children involved in economic activities at or above the age-specific threshold. And that 1.8% were involved in household chores at or above the age-specific threshold in 2019. Therefore, the, the proportion of children involved in hazardous work also declined to 8% in 2019, 2020, compared to 13% in 2014. This is a UNICEF report, and that this has gone down even further based on the number of children that are in school. During the COVID uh, pandemic, school were closed, business were closed, people lost their jobs, as all other parts of the world, and that many children who were 15 and over in particular went and got jobs as uh, working at car washes and at, um, at the, the bus parks, the transportation parks. Access to justice in the backlog of cases. Um, there is a backlog of cases, we admit, in the civil cases and, and criminal, and that we do not have statistics from the courts on this matter. And as I said, what measures we were asked to reduce delays in criminal cases, we have pointed out new courts, the issue of the Bail Act and the Restorative Justice Act, for example, the, and the Bail Act is particularly targeted to reducing prison overcrowding by reducing the lengthy pretrial detentions, as well as the Narcotic, Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Amendment Act, which provides for alternative sentencing by the courts. We also want to refer to the fact that the Justice Restorative Justice Act also provides for the establishment of um, a restorative justice center as a main body to oversight this and to have eventually regional centers of restorative justice to ensure that the criminal justice system is responsive and that case the number of case uh, caseload is reduced, but also increasing use of alternative sentencing. We are also looking at uh, new criminal procedure rules that would help to make um, the process easier. And this, of course, would be led by the judiciary. One of the legislation that is before the parliament is the um, criminal procedure plea discussion plea agreement and assistance agreement bill was tabled in December 2023, as well as the paper committals. Just yeah, the paper committals bill of 2023 was also tabled in the National Assembly in February 2024. These two pieces of legislation will assist in expediting cases in court. The first one, the paper committal, refers uh, provides for the abolition of preliminary inquiries that will therefore allow at least two years, it will reduce at least two years off the process of having a uh, case concluded, and that the plea bargaining obviously allows for establishment of a system of plea discussions and plea agreements in criminal procedures relating um, to both summary and indictable offenses. The Judicial Service Commission and points were made about the president and the appointments by the president. First of all, I will provide with you, um, before I go to that, let me give you the legal aid clinic um, data that you sought. As, as you know, the legal aid clinic is a separate entity. It is independent of the government. Legal. Yeah, our legal aid clinic and the Linden legal aid clinic are private entities that receive a subvention from the government. They have not, uh, in recent times, publicized the data that you're asking. We don't have access to that. However, their, their subvention from through the Ministry of Human Services and Social Protection under Social Services um, shows that between 2020, their allocation of 59.9 million has incrementally increased to 2024 
being 92.3 million. The Linden Legal Aid Clinic subvention has also been increased from 2020 of 15.9 million to 2024, 21.6 million. So with that, this is the government's contribution to ensure that persons, particularly poor and vulnerable, and women in particular, have access to free services. We also reported to you that yesterday of the pro bono initiative to have legal services offered by lawyers through an agreement with the Bar Association of Guyana. We reported on that yesterday, and in terms of them reaching uh, areas of the country. We gave a number of uh, people, over 3,000 people, have been able to access since it was launched approximately a year ago. We have a number of issues we still have to report on, and therefore the issue of that has been raised about the president and the appointments and the leading opposition. Should I stop, Madam Chairman? Because there are many more questions to ask. I, I can't answer all these questions in 25 minutes. Thank you very much, Ms. Teixeira, for the replies furnished thus far. We will now turn to follow-up questions, and then we'll turn things back to you to give the delegation some additional time to respond. With regard to the methodology, I'd just like to clarify a couple of points. Firstly, the information the committee has received a great deal of information which needs to be clarified and expounded upon. And this is the perfect opportunity for the state to do that, for the state to provide greater detail uh, and more precise information to the committee. Now, we're aware from our side that we've asked a lot of questions, but these questions are asked, they're spurred by the desire of the committee to get clarification on a number of points, points that we've drawn from the information that you have given to us. And that is why we give the state party the opportunity to respond in writing to some of those questions that uh, the state party isn't able to answer orally. And we do thank the delegation for the effort and the endeavor they're making to answer orally where they can. But I'd like to remind the state party that this is the only opportunity that members of the committee will have to ask questions for uh, ask questions of clarification, etc., and to delve deeper into certain issues and to feed into our concluding observations. And so we think that this is an important interactive space. It's helpful for the state party to engage in this interactive dialogue so that we can tease out and expand upon issues of clarification. And once again, a reminder that anything we can't get to in the oral interaction this afternoon can be answered in writing in the 48 hours following the conclusion of this interactive dialogue. Mr. Gruja is the first of the speakers for follow-up questions. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and my thanks uh, to you also for having reminded us all of the methodology, because when we get bogged down and caught up in the dialogue, the quality and nature of the replies does improve as people get more natural, more comfortable in the way in which the interactive dialogue is proceeding. But I think it is a useful reminder also to make it clear that there's an additional 48 hours for the state party to answer in writing. For example, they can answer in writing on the questions I asked about the electoral system. I want to pick up on a question asked by my colleague, Mr. El Haiba, on the situation and status of children. And this harks back to a question asked by Cedro. And this is the whole question or issue of nationality and the way it's in which it is transmitted to children, in particular to children born abroad. According to information from credible sources and from many such sources that we have received, in domestic law in Guyana, it seems there are problems, both legislative and practical problems, in ensuring that nationality can be transmitted to children born abroad, who thus run the risk of statelessness, particularly when pa their parents don't have dual nationality. So I'd like to ask whether since the concluding observations of CEDAW were sent to you, whether the domestic position has changed, the legislation has changed, to ask you what measures have been taken to protect children from falling, uh, from ending up stateless. And as I say, this risk of statelessness uh, affects children born to Guyanese parents abroad, in particular single parent families. The risk of statelessness is run in particular by children born to single Guyanese mothers abroad. And so I'd like to ask for any information about the steps taken by the State Party to address these concerns and points. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Gruja, says the Chair. The next speaker on my list is Mr. Quesada.
Thank you, Jeff. The head of delegation will provide us with replies to some of the questions uh, that we asked in writing, but there are some of the questions that haven't yet been answered, questions on trafficking, aliens, refugees, asylum seekers. Possibly answers for that will be forthcoming, as I say, already now or in writing. I do have some follow-up questions on the justice system. I would request detailed information as to the measures that have been adopted by Guyana, including legislative measures to fine tune and improve access to justice. And on this whole issue of access to justice and the steps that need to be taken to improve it, I would request the state party delegation to provide me with more specific detail on free legal aid and how this is provided to indigenous communities. Are indigenous communities in any way guaranteed access to free legal aid? And if so, how is this provided, etc.? Thank you very much. Thank you for those follow-up questions, Mr. Quesada. The next speaker on my list is Mr. Helfer. Thank you, Chair, and my sincere thanks to the delegation for uh, taking the time to clarify some of the issues that I raised. That is the purpose of this dialogue for us to raise various issues and have an opportunity for the state party to respond. I'm especially pleased to hear that with respect to cybercrime, uh, head of delegation uh, committed or said that there were plans to amend uh, the relevant statute to remove the provision on sedition. Uh, I have only three points that I did not hear answered, and forgive me if I, I missed them. We do ask a lot of questions, and so obviously that requires a lot of from you by way of response. And uh, one would relate to any plans to decriminalize defamation, whether that is also in the works. Uh, the second was with respect to whether the status of uh, the process for amending the Amerindian Act of 2006. And the third and final point is any uh, comment the state party has with respect to its response to the decision of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in the Isenero versus Guiana case with respect to uh, responding to the alleged violations in that case and the reparations for the indigenous peoples uh, that brought that proceeding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Helfer. The next speaker is Mr. El Khaiba. Yes, you know that. Thank you, Chair. And I also thank the delegation for the information uh, provided to the committee. I would like to circle back to a question that I asked yesterday on femicides. And I would ask the delegation to provide us in writing within the set time frame of 48 hours information as to the number of femicides, information on prosecutions and sentencing in uh, cases of femicides. With regard to children, the committee has taken note of the 2018 law on justice of minors or juvenile justice. I would like to ask the state party what steps it has taken to guarantee that the best interests of the child prevail. You yourself referred to that principle earlier. And so I'd like to ask whether the state party intends to create a specific mechanism for the protection of the rights of children, uh, a mechanism that would be in line with the international standards in the subject area. This is an issue that would be cross-cutting, that would concern various different departments. So if there is no single unified mechanism to monitor and oversee children's rights in place, uh, similar to mechanisms for the prevention of torture, for example, or 
and I would include the aspect of a mechanism to protect and the rights and well-being of children with disabilities as well, either as part of that broader mechanism or separately. So I'd ask the delegation to provide us with information on that issue, whether any such mechanisms exist or are envisaged. On child labour, we didn't receive any replies or any statistics, that is, particularly with regard to the number of children working in rural areas. In particular, I would ask information about children in Amerindian Indian communities who are working. I understood you to say that your priority is to provide is to find ways for children to complete their schooling. But of course, that requires effective mechanisms to guarantee that access to education so that goal can be set. So I'd have a question about the existence of those mechanisms as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. El Haiba. The next speaker on my list is Mr. Santos Pais. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. Unfortunately, <laughs> my question on the judiciary was on the time limit for the intervention of the delegation. So I hope <laughs> that this will at a time the delegation will be able to comment on my questions, of course. The concern that I have is that uh, if the head of the executive appoints almost all judicial officers, including members of a Judicial Services Commission, there is at least a suspicion of interference, both government and legislative leader of uh, the opposition, in the appointment and career of judges and public prosecutors. And so I would insist on the question and, and particularly to see whether there are any intentions on the ongoing constitutional process in order to create self-governing bodies for both judges and prosecutors in order for them to avoid any type of undue influence on uh, by other branches of government. It's not enough just to say that you have independent agencies if the persons that run these agencies are appointed by those that should not appoint them. Thank you. Thank you very much for those follow-up questions, Mr. Santos Baez. The next speaker on the list is the last speaker on the list, Mr. Carazzo. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And once again, I'd like to convey my gratitude to the delegation. Thanks in particular to Her Excellency, Ms. Tekshira, for the very in-depth replies to the questions that I put. I have take, I would also like to echo the reminder of the methodology for this interactive dialogue that we were reminded of by the chair and to underscore the fact that this is intended to be a constructive dialogue. I emphasize that word constructive. It's a golden opportunity for states parties who have submitted their reports to provide additional explanations to flesh out the information in those reports including responses to contradictory information and reports that may have been received by the committee. So it can be a genuine dialogue. We listened very carefully to the details of the constitutional and legal structure that the Republic of Guyana, the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, I should say, has developed, particularly when it comes to the promotion and protection of human rights as well as the steps and the legislative and other standards that the that Guyana has developed to promote participation in public affairs and public life. It's a very unique structure that you have established, a very distinct one, and it, we can see that it provides for the participation of opposition parties in the development of standards for the protection of human rights and for the protection of the right of the people to participate in public and social life, etc. And our hope is that this would also include for the full participation of community representatives, civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations. And it would seem that there is room to expand Guyana's approach 
to ensure the full participation of CSOs and NGOs, which is not yet the case today as a result of actions by the government, the administration, etc. So I think there's particular room to expand the infrastructure you've set up to make greater space for civil society organisations. We are concerned by the text of Article 154 of the Constitution, which provides for the possibility of, in your interpretation, application of human rights conventions and treaties. It provides for the ability, it provides an ability for the state party to reduce the scope or coverage of protection. I was reminded in one of your responses that I hadn't, or I was remarked by you that I hadn't read the second part of your Article 154. I'd like to reassure you that I have read fully Article 154 of your constitution. And I'm wondering whether as part of your constitutional reform, this second section of Article 154 of your current constitution, which provides for the possibility or provides for the option for the government with a vote of two thirds of the members of the Congress, to reduce the level of compliance or to excuse the state from full compliance with the provisions of international treaties to which is a state party. I'd like to ask to what extent you believe that that second part of Article 154, which does provide for this rather troubling option for the state party to reduce its responsibilities in terms of obligations, might be revised or modified, if not scrapped, so that the state party is in a position to live up fully to its obligations under international treaties. A response to that question is of particular interest to this committee. Your Excellency, members of the delegation, we have seen in our region of the Caribbean and Central America, a region from which I also hail, and we've also seen this in other parts of the world, to what extent natural resources have been pillaged, have and how natural wealth has been stripped to the bones and any wealth generated by the use of these natural resources has not been evenly distributed. The desire of this committee, the desire of the human rights architecture writ large, is to support member states, including the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, in processes intended to ensure the best and fairest distribution of wealth derived from natural resources can promote the well-being and the human rights of all people. And those human rights can be enjoyed and respected and upheld by and for the entire population of the country. We have listened in this constructive dialogue uh, to your response, and, but much of the framework and much of our analysis of the documents provided to us by the Republic of Guyana that are in such an dialogue are based on that aspiration. We have one further speaker on the list, says the Chair, Mr. Ndiaye, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Given that this is the first time that I'm taking the floor in this interactive dialogue, with Guyana, I'd like to take this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to the Guyanese delegation and to thank them and commend them on the exchange that we are continuing today. I know that Guyana is a fairly unique country uh, in Latin America, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's the only English speaking country in the continent of South America. And it has a great deal of richness amongst its population, which is a mix of uh, African, Indian, Asian, European descent. But that racial mix has given rise to conflicts in the past. And so I'd like to ask whether there is a pol policy currently in place in order to ensure that rather than division, there be an appreciation of the richness and wealth that is represented by the diversity of the country, that it be understood along those lines by everyone in the country, everyone sees that diversity is a strength and that everyone be encouraged to avoid discriminating against anyone else in society on the basis of their ethnic background, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question, Mr. Ndaye. My thanks to all members of the committee who took the floor in this round of follow-up questions. 
We now, given that we did not use up all the time set aside for follow-up questions, we have some additional time for the delegation to respond or to seek to respond to the maximum extent possible to the follow-up questions and any other outstanding questions. You have 25 minutes. And with that, I turn things back over to you, Madam Head of Delegation, Ms. Gail Teixeira. Constructive dialogue always. And we appreciate the questions being asked, but we also find it difficult in a live streaming situation where the public hears and everybody in the world can hear, and we are unable to have enough time to respond to some very detailed questions that are being asked for us. We appreciate that these will be submitted in writing. However, the persons who are on in the live stream will not see those answers or hear them. And so that's the disadvantage we're at, and we hope you appreciate that that's the disadvantage that we have by adding live streaming, which we like and we agree with totally, that we also have to make sure that both parties are in a constructive dialogue of being equal, equally able to respond. And there are a number of very important things I want to respond to, and I hope I can do it in the additional time that you made available. I thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the issue to do with 154, Article 154, which the last person has asked. Yes, as we pointed out yesterday, it is a two-thirds majority required in the Parliament to remove or derogate from any human right in our, our constitution and or in any of the conventions we have signed. Um, how easy is that, he asks? Very hard. It is very, very difficult to get two-thirds majority in our Parliament. Um, the numbers are, are not vastly apart. And so the government has 33 seats. The opposition to it together, there's two parties, have 32 seats. And therefore, two thirds is not an easy thing. And in addition to that, sir, there are parts of our constitution that if you wish to change, you have to not only get a two thirds majority, but you have to go to a referendum. This issue, I'm sure that in the constitutional reform, there may be issues raised, I'm not sure, on this issue. But no government, as far as I know, can, can um, capriciously uh, remove these covenants that we have ratified. Um, and so I wish to reassure that the, we believe that our constitution builds in protection to these rights. Uh, the issue of natural wealth being shared, we have reported here. The increase in allocations for health and education. The fact that in every Indian village in our society, or indigenous village in our society, Every rural village in our society, every municipality, there are schools for children at the nursery, primary, and in the regions, which are large, we have secondary schools where children come in the interior areas where their dormitory is provided. And so, as a country of less than 800,000 people and coming from a poor background in the past, we have made amazing changes in terms of free education, free health, subsidized housing, Increases in the water availability in interior and rural areas and electricity. And may I say to the honorable member who has asked the question, the issue of, we have a program, we cannot afford to um, put in electricity in every single indigenous village or our interior far villages. And what we have done is to have a program of the solar panels distribution where these communities will get and have been getting in the Labia program we started under the office of the prime minister that and the Ghana Energy Agency. In thus far, 28,952 homes in the interior of our country in the river and areas of our country have received solar panels and will be for the first time being able to turn on lights in their house. This was particularly started in 24, 12, 13, 20, uh, 15 and was halted um, when the then government came in afterwards and it has been resuscitated. And this was particularly designed to allow children to be able to study at night. And that was the impetus of this, the household solar uh, program. We also have built wells and, and uh, in many of the villages which didn't have access to clean water before. The issues are, that have been raised about judges and the J Judicial Service Commission and the suspense, suspicion of interference. 
Just to go back again, the Judicial Service Commission is appointed as follows. The Chair of the Public Service Commission, the Chancellor of the Judiciary, the Chief Justice of the Judiciary, one name that comes from Parliament regarding an, a lawyer, a legal person who is not active in the profession, and one name who is a lawyer or a judge, retired, that is agreed to between the President and the leading opposition. That is the Judicial Service Commission. So even if the president had sway and was able to convince the leading opposition to appoint a man he liked, the commission itself has other persons on it who are not, uh, who may or may not uh, be uh, uh, supportive. The other issue is that if the point has been made about appointments of judges and prosecutors. The prosecutors are not appointed by the Judicial Service Commission. The Director of Public Prosecutions to appoints uh, prosecutions, not the Judicial Service Commission. And her office is also, the office of the Director of Public Prosecution is also a constitutional post, which the, uh, describe, the Constitution prescribes how that post is appointed. The points that were raised to do with um, the appointment in the Chancellor and the Chief Justice, and we can come back to that, yeah. The, when in the 1999-2001 constitutional reform process, politically at the two major political parties, following a lot of violence, that the effort was made to return to normalcy and to accommodate and to ensure that the opposition party did not feel left out of the process. And so what was built into were well, certain a number of constitutional appointments that under other constitutions, including in the region, that the president or the governor general or the prime minister in other countries would appoint directly that this would have to be done with the concurrence of the leading opposition, who in actual fact has a veto vote on the appointment by the president. And so, so too, we designed and we have to now in the constitutional reform process, which we're starting again, review that. Does that make sense still? The Guyanese people will decide that. But the constitutional article 127 requires that the chancellor and chief justice to be appointed by agreement of the president of Guyana and the leading opposition. These parties have been unable to agree for some time, resulting in the current situation. Actually, the previous chancellor and chief justice served for years in acting positions to their detriment regarding their pensions and other benefits they would have been entitled to if they'd been fully appointed. It is not a recent occurrence. The, the former uh, Chancellor and Chief Justice, after the amendment was made in the Constitution, suffered the same fate. And therefore, we have to review these political interventions in the Constitution, which was meant to build harmony and a greater working relationship between the President and the opposition. We, however, want to make it very clear that this formula has not resulted in control, direction, or lack of independence of the judiciary. And all we have to do is to appoint, point to the cases in court where the two persons, the Chief Justice, has handed down various decisions against that very administration, the former government, and including this government. Um, this includes a decision against the former Attorney General compelling him to put the, the Judicial Review Act into effect. More importantly, following the 2020 elections, the last administration challenged the results of those elections in two election petitions. The Chief Justice ruled against the election petitions, paving the way for the new administration. In addition to that, the same Chief Justice has handed down decisions that are not in favor of the new government who came into power following her decisions. The judges of the High Court, including the Chief Justice, has ruled against the government in matters brought by the environmental activists against the EPA. And I could go on with a list of those. But our issue is that are they being fair? And are they doing what they're supposed to do? And that is to uh, adjudicate in a fair and transparent manner. That is all we ask of them. And so the allegations that, there is, that they are compromised, we find uh, offensive. And I'm sure the judiciary, if they're listening, would find that too. 
school. Now, there are a number of issues. That the issue to do, so the, the fact that it said the, the appointments to do with judges. Let me just clarify that. The Judicial Service Commission makes recommendations to the president to appoint. In fact, the Judicial Service Commission sends a list to the president to appoint. If the president has a concern with any name, he has to put in writing, as stated in the Constitution, disclosing what his concerns are about the particular judge. The Judicial Service Commission will review that and will respond. If they say that they do not accept the grounds on which the president is opposing a particular judge, and they rule in that way, the president has no choice but to appoint. That is the Constitution of Guyana. And in fact, there was a case like that. In the 2012-2015 period, there was a, a, a proposed appointment by the then Judicial Service Commission, and the then president was not in favor of one of them because he felt he had been a political activist in a youth organization for decades. Um, the president made his concerns to the Judicial Service Commission in writing. The Judicial Service then responded and said, you're wrong. We don't agree with you. These facts are wrong. And the president had no choice but to appoint the judge. And that judge is still in the system up to today. So that's an example where, for the first time, there was an issue in terms of a particular judge, and that was resolved as stated in our Constitution, as provided for in our Constitution. The <clears throat> there was a, a rather strange question asked. I, I must uh, deal with it. Um, and that was to do with nationality. A person's born abroad. A constitution makes it clear that once you are born of a man or a woman who are Guyanese, you are Guyanese. All it requires is the birth certificate of where they're born and that it, only one parent is required, male or female, and that birth certificate is brought in to the birth and registration office, and then the birth certificate of a Guyanese born overseas is issued. So the person will have the birth certificate of their own country where they were born, and a country, uh, a Guyanese birth certificate. There's no application process except to apply for a birth certificate under those grounds. Having got that birth certificate, the person can go straight to the immigration department to apply for a Guyanese passport. We're not aware of any such issues that Guyanese are facing. However, our constitution nor our laws deal with second generation. So that it is direct descent or birth. And so there are, the Guyanese population is large overseas because of the struggles we had for free and fair elections and democracy. It is estimated that there are over a million people overseas. And so we are have a situation where there's the second generation and the constitution nor the laws provide for second generation. Right. So that the, I'm sorry, that, that this is not an issue as far as we know. But if they are second generation, then our law does not provide for it, nor does our constitution. And that's an issue, I guess, will come up in constitutional reform, because there are issues to do with the diaspora also that have an interest and will be consulted with the constitutional reform. Many of them want to be able to hold on to dual citizenship and be in parliament and to vote for elected posts. So these are issues all within that. We're not aware of any child being made stateless. Our constitution and our citizenship act uh, prohibit statelessness of children or anybody else. And therefore, um, and that in fact, um, we have had a number of cases where we have interceded to assist in favor of the applicants who may be confronted 
with some situations that the, the member asking the questions um, were raised. So we're not aware of any new issues. But we have to recognize we have to obey and work within the law as it is before us, whilst one looks at um, making changes. There were issues raised uh, earlier, which I didn't get to respond to, um, which I should. <clears throat> there were issues raised to do with the Haitians and the CARICOM Treaty of Chagaramas and what Ghana did. Between 2017 and 2021, there were suspicions that Haitians were being trafficked in Guyana because they would be brought through the airport with the, as a result of the abolition of the visa um, that countries did in the CARICOM, including Guyana, in 2019, that we had a number of persons would land at the airports here and travel across the country to the other borders, south, south borders, to go into Brazil which has asylum seeking. And this went on and went on, including we were able with intelligence service to notice that many of them did not have a passport, but the persons who were handling them had them. A decision was taken when a number of Haitians were found wandering around the jungle, no food, but they were dropped off by a handler and told they would come back and never did because they hadn't paid. And that is when the decision was taken by the government that to remove the six, the six months, no visa requirement to come to Guyana. By that time, a number of countries in the Caribbean and the CARICOM, Caribbean community, had already um, reversed the six month, no visa requirement for Haitians. There is no prejudice or bias against Haitians in Guyana. Historically, Guyana has stood by the Haitian people in their struggles against Papa Doc and Baby Doc, and today, we, as, we again, in particular, as the head of the CARICOM heads of government, our president is heading the CARICOM heads of government at this stage, at this point. The CARICOM heads, as well as the president, have played an important role in trying to return to normalcy in Haiti. And I'm sure the, the statements and press statements are available, that we do not want to see Haiti be reduced. Um, Um, so that there is no, the Haitians were coming in in large amounts. The Venezuelans weren't coming as trafficking in the early part, nor are we aware of that, but they were escaping from, um, from, from their country because of the situation there. There are approximately 40,000 Venezuelans here. Uh, a large group of them are Guyanese who went to Venezuela in the 70s, 80s, 90s because of the political situation who are returning with their children. And because they're Guyanese, they are absorbed immediately into the society because they are Guyanese. Once they can show that they were born here or they were born in Venezuela and able to access, and one parent is a Guyanese. We have opened our doors to Venezuela in a particular way because we too as Guyanese fled to Venezuela in the 1970s and the 80s. And they were able to accommodate us. And so we, we feel it's important for us, our moral duty, to have a humanitarian approach to the Venezuelans. But we cannot accept trafficking of persons. And where we do know of trafficking of persons, and we, we are able to address those. We wish to remind that under the Anti-Money Laundering and Countering the Financing of Terrorism Amendment Act 2023, the act of smuggling of my, migrants is now criminalized. It was not criminalized prior to that in the original anti, um, combating of trafficking uh, act. And so there are very serious penalties for persons who are trafficking migrants. In terms of trafficking in persons, just to advise you that in 2022 and 2023, three persons were convicted for the offense of trafficking in persons, two males and one female, in order to pay a collective sum of 8.4 million Ghana dollars in restitution to the victims. In 2023, seven new defendants were prosecuted in relation to 28 cases and 32 charges under both trafficking and non-trafficking uh, laws. A number of non-national uh, women were uh, have been uh, discovered that they were being trafficking, trafficked, and they have been 
uh, were according to our laws and our policies. They are offered safe haven. They are offered shelters, and that they do. We do not. We do not uh, carry out um, sending people back who are victims of trafficking. And so, if they wish to stay, they stay. If they wish to go home, then we try to find a way financially to get them home back to their countries. But there is no. Uh, we do not believe in uh, reform. And therefore, we have a position of enforcing non reform in our country, even though we don't have a refugee uh, legislation or asylum legislation. Regards to data that was asked about refugees, we wish to make it clear that we do not offer refugee status. The UN um, body here that deals with refugees um, appears to be handling that and that we are aware that they have given refugee status uh, to persons, but we don't have that information, nor do we know who the persons are. But however, in Guyana, we have quite a liberal immigration uh, policy, and it is not difficult to be able to get visas into Guyana, nor to get work permits once one has skills or is willing to work. The issue was asked about ensuring legal uh, assistance to persons who are from indigenous communities and remote communities. We had reported yesterday that uh, that the process legal aid clinic is deals with that as a separate entity. However, we reported yesterday on the Pro Bono 500 initiative, which has been started by the Ministry of Human Services under the Spotlight Program, which is funded by the European Union and comes through the United Nations to us. We have a number of interventions in so that persons in interior locations can have. There's an important question that was asked about the process for Amerindian consultation on the revision of the Amerindian Act. And I need to be able to say that. The Amerindian Act, I'm not aware of what kind of consultation went on in the former government. But I can report that in 2023, training of persons in the Amerindian Act. So in other words, what they, what we are doing is, first of all, to go back to look at the Act as it is and to train people in terms of leading off in the different villages. And therefore, then the, the, the discussion on the Act will start. So the exercise of the revision is being executed in collaboration with the National Tushar's Council, which is the legitimate elected authority of the indigenous leaders of Guyana, covered by the constitution and law, and the Attorney General's chambers. The review process began, the review process began with the training of 54 facilitators, 14 of which were national Tushar executive members, 25 were community development officers, and 15 CSOs, these are 15 community service officers, um, to be able on the Amerindian Act to understand and how to facilitate consultations in the village. They then transitioned the execution of pre-examination the Act in cluster form to identify the key areas of revision. This training saw 3,663 Amerindian leaders, secretaries, treasurers, and residents participating at the Amerindian Act 2006 Education and Awareness Workshops throughout the regions of Ghana. Training was also held in regions 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, and 9, including the 20 National Tushar's Council Executive. This pre-exam will now be followed by the interventions looking at the Act itself. This is in, in adherence to the principle of ethic and ensuring that all Indigenous people understand the existing legislation to be able to contribute to its strengthening. Village gatherings saw over 3,250 residents, 345 village councillors, and 78 Tushars uh, were trained and they continue to be trained. And so the issue of ethnic and, and involvement of the Indigenous people is critical to our, um, <clears throat> to the revision of the Amendment Act as well as constitutional reform process and any of the major national 
decisions that a country makes. There were issues raised <clears throat> in relation to mining and Rupununi. And I wish to clarify that a company's name was called here. And I wish to make it very clear that the company <clears throat> does not have a prospecting license. Right. It has a it has a prospective license, not a mining license. And so the company that was referred to by one of the committee members does not mine. They have a prospecting license. They're completely two different mine licenses. In fact, the miners in that area are from the Region 9, Rupanuni, who have been given a special license to be able to mine in that area after many consultations between the Guyana Geology and Mines and the Ministry of Natural Resources. Lastly, we want to be able to say that the issue of the Amarindian um, land titling, maybe you are unaware and I'd like to inform you that the multi-stakeholder group is the one that on the on the Amarindian land title is made up of representatives of the non-governmental organizations of the Amarindian people including also the National Two Shells Council. The Armenian People's Association sits on that, as does the NTC. And the work plan for 2024, which is before us, has in it 24, um, 39 demarcations and 24 absolute titles. Sorry, I beg your pardon. So 24 absolute titles and 39 demarcations. This is the 2024 plan of action that has been agreed to by the multi-stakeholder group, which includes civil society. There is no doubt that the problem in Guyana sometimes is that the civil society groups do not recognize other civil society groups and believe that they must be the only ones that are consulted. We go to all the variety of people, whether they're fisher folk, whether they're trade union, whether they're minors, women, etc., to ensure that they're part of major policy and laws that we're bringing in, including constitutional reform. Can I continue, Madam Chair, or you? Are, uh, I've ended my time. I'm not sure where I am. No, it's uh, unfortunate. Unfortunately, head of delegation, we are running out of time. There were even some colleagues who wished to uh, make a few comments before you offered your closing remarks. So at this point, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Santos Pais. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. I'd like to thank very much the head of the delegation for providing some explanations on the reason of the interference of both executive and legislative on the appointment of judges. I understand the history behind it. I didn't want in the main instant to be offensive to the members of the judiciary of Guyana. But I think it, it's hard that the head of the executive and the leader of the opposition intervene in the appointment of, of judges. Because, as you know better than I, the question of judges relates to its independence, impartiality, and security of tenure. And you have confessed that first, there is politicization in the nomination of these persons, that there is unsecure of tenor when you're acting as magistrate. And the, the fact that there is an interference in the appointment itself raises doubts as to the possible way that people perceive the independence of judiciary. We have to distinguish between the impartiality that the judges exercise and the way public sees them to exercise these impartiality. And that's what concerns me. And that's one of the reasons why I ask what would be the measures to, in a certain sense, increase the confidence of the population of Guyana in their judiciary. And as for the public prosecution, you told us that the director of public prosecution appoints prosecutors. But where then is their internal independence and the external independence? So. I would sincerely hope that uh, the next constitutional reform or the ongoing constitutional reform would probably look into this with fresh eyes and see if it was not the time coming for the judges and prosecutors to elect themselves without interference by other branches of government. Then you would be sure that there was no interference whatsoever 
by any other branch of the government except the judiciary itself. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Santos Pais. And now it's the time to hear the closing remarks from the head of delegation. You have the floor. Madam Chairperson, we wish to reiterate what we've been saying here on the advances made in Guyana and the progress that's been made in Guyana in our country, that the interventions of leaving nobody behind, no person behind, no one behind, is a reality that we're striving for in all the sectors, social sectors, etc. The transformation of our country and its physical infrastructure is to improve communication, access, transportation, reduce the cost for people from various parts of the country, and of course, to enhance business and economic activity, jobs. This is what is our responsibility. And we believe that these are issues that must be noted. Rights in documents in constitutions are critical. And our constitutional legal framework provide for those rights. But the challenges always come in terms of what is the infrastructure? How is it accessible? How does it work? And that is what a lot of effort has gone into, to create rights commissions for redress, courts that are more responsive and available. And so I understand what the last person said about perceptions, but the proof of the pudding, as they say, is how do the judges rule? If it is that the judges are always ruling for the government, one may have the right to come to that conclusion. But if judges in this country are ruling as they think, even when the government doesn't agree, even when people outside don't agree, then they're doing their jobs. And so we can sit and, and you know look at that. I don't know about election of judges. In countries where, why, why would a judge be elected? He has to go to the electorate to be a politician? No, that will not happen in Guyana. And so we have developed a construct that we believe allows for. The president is given names by, I referred two days ago, to the fact that the Judicial Service has appointed nine new magistrates and is going through the vacancies to fill nine new judges. When they finish their process in the Judicial Service, they will send those names to the president. And the president will appoint whether he disagrees and I, as I explained earlier, he has a right to disagree. In the appointment of the judicial service, it's one person that has to have the agreement between the president and the leading opposition. No one else in the judicial service commission. So I think we have to be, we have to look at the construct of Ghana to try to ensure that there was an accommodation between the government and leading opposition to work together in a more um, constructed manner. It may not have worked as was conceived by those in the constitutional reform process of 1999, 2001. And one of the last speakers, the gentleman who didn't ask it questions during the committee, he asked for how do we deal with the issues of ethnicity and uh, perceptions, etc., in a multi-ethnic society. And these are some of the constructs we've come up with. These were done together, Guyanese together, trying to answer this issue. And so even in the GCOM, the issues are raised with the Elections Commission. We brought in legislation to try to remove any lacunas or ambiguities in the election laws that would have allowed, allowed what happened in 2020 elections where the senior officials of GCOM with the former members of government tried to thwart and to um, defraud the Guyanese people of their right to elect a government of their choice. And this was supported by the United Nations Security Council, um, the Secretary General, the Commonwealth head, the OAS head on Margo, and also Carter Center. So that the issue of 2020 elections was not to do with ethnicity. It was to do with a power struggle 
by the then government and the conspiracy of the senior most persons in the election machinery to rig an election. It had nothing to do with ethnicity. And the second issue, we've had elections after that of the 2023 local government elections where 80 um, local authority bodies were voted in and that again, there was no violence. There was no issue of ethnicity. There was no issue of fraud that was raised in that period. So that we hope that the changes in the, and this were, this local government election was held under the uh, new amendments that we made to the representation of the People's Act. The issue of transparency is one that is important to our society. And so we are built in a number of ways to have transparency. These are new interventions with, as I point on the very first day that we are creating digital platforms, the country was not connected. The country is being connected. And therefore these access to various uh, services, as well as being able to have data produced in a timely manner will improve. But many of these interventions are a year old, less than a year old, two years old. And so we cannot produce the, some of the information you request. But I do want to say that um, Guyana is a country that democracy and the restoration of democracy and its uneven path to building democracy has taught us many lessons and created many unique features which you would not find in the rest of the Western Hemisphere, not in Latin America, not in the Caribbean because we've had to address our challenges by ourselves. But democracy and the expression, freedom of expression, the right to exp express your views, is not isolated to one group of people. Every citizen and the government and the opposition and anybody has a right to their, view, their views, political views, criticism, etc. But it cannot be a situation where a small group of people seem to be wielding a tyranny of the minority that believe that they alone are the conscience of Guyana, regardless of what the government says, regardless of what any, any other NGO says. Any NGO that does not agree with them that then gets labeled as pro-government, which is unfair to them. And so we want to build a democratic nation, but we don't want anarchy. We will not allow anarchy. Because what would have been called gossip years ago is now become, thanks to the social media and websites, it has become now fact. And so we are not referring to anything particular any committee member said, but the national stakeholders of Guyana and the civil society organizations are hundreds of organizations, not three or four, not five. There are many more that have opinions and play a role in their communities, whether it's in charity or valuable work with children, after school programs, domestic violence, they are important too, and their views are important too. And so we don't want to see the 21st century Jacobinism where those who shout the loudest and those who have access to social media are the ones who determine the fate of any country or any issue that is available or being dealt with. This will lead to the dismantle of democracy. We have fought too long to build it and therefore we accept, we accept that we haven't reached where we want to go yet. We, that there are many challenges we have. But again, we're a small developing country with less than 800,000 people. And that the speed at which we're going with our transformation, we need many more people in our country. We need many more skilled laborers and, and investments. And that is what we're investing in. As I said in the initial presentation and on the first day um, in regards to that. So that we accept and have always accepted the treaty bodies and reviewing. But it is difficult that I find it difficult to be asked here to answer on an issue with IACHR and Asinaru when, as far as I know, we are not concluded the process with the IACHR 
on this you know, issue. And so I'm not even aware that certain documents are public in the public realm. So that I cannot answer on that, and I will not answer on that, because I believe that even when we've said to the ICHR that some of these same matters are being dealt with by another UN body, the ICHR tells us that um, they, there's no need, uh, they can go to several international bodies at the same time. So we're inundated with petitions by a small group of people who are well financed. We don't want to demilitarize. Uh, so sorry. Uh, we we'll, don't, have, we'll, we don't um, have an interpretation. You already use all the time allowed it. Well, I would like to uh, thanks to the delegation here in Guyana for this presentation. And we don't have more time, so we have to finish in this way. It's not appropriate, uh, but it's, uh, all the, the time was already used. So I would like to apologize for the interpretation, Gavin. And no, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much.
to this dialogue. We particularly welcome the representatives of the Guyanese delegation, both those here in the room and those joining us remotely. A very good afternoon also to representatives of civil society organizations, students, academics, and all those who are joining us, including guests from other committees. We also welcome those uh, staff from the OHCHR who are joining this dialogue. We'll begin with the second round of questions to the State Party, and we begin by giving the floor to Mr. El Haiba. Mr. El Haiba, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. As my first order of business, I would like to welcome Her Excellency the Minister, the Head of Delegation, and all her fellow members of the delegation both those who are joining us from the capital and those who are here in Geneva. And also very good afternoon to all those following us online. I'd also like to uh, uh, remember Mr. Bulkan Harif, whom the committee misses a great deal. He was a very welcome and key member of this committee during his time serving with us. He was my neighbor, moreover. He used to sit next to me, so I know him very well, and I wish him every success in his new role in the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights. I'm going to address three issues at the start of this second part of the interactive dialogue, and these will relate to paragraphs 9, 10, and 11 of the list of issues. More specifically, I'll be asking questions about gender equality, violence against women and domestic violence, and voluntary termination of pregnancy or abortion. So beginning with paragraph nine, gender equality. The state party has rolled out a raft of political and legislative measures to promote gender equality and to ensure an equitable or balanced representation of women in both public and political life. May I ask what specific actions the State Party has undertaken to introduce or strengthen legal quotas for women's representation in national and local legislative assemblies? And may I ask how the State Party monitors and assesses the impact of any such measures to promote gender equality and to promote legal quotas in the national and local legislative assemblies? We note that the State Party has taken initiatives to increase the number of women in leadership posts. Under this heading, I would like to ask what specific obstacles the State Party has been able to identify that need to be overcome to improve equitable representation for women. What strategies have been implemented to set aside those obstacles? May I also ask what training and awareness raising initiatives have been rolled out or put in place by the State Party to encourage a greater take up and better application of gender equality provisions in judicial and political decision making. The committee notes that the salary gap between men and women is more marked in the independent sector, which underscores the need for ongoing initiatives to balance this wage gap. In addition to the political and public life and measures taken at this level, what additional measures has the State Party taken to promote gender equality and to increase women's participation in the economic and educational spheres? Concerning the training programmes on gender equality and greater women's representation and engagement that the State Party has rolled out, the committee wishes to know how these programs are delivered at all decision making levels, including for the judiciary and others working in the justice sector. What does training in these key sectors look like? Does the State Party intend to develop indicators so that they can properly assess the impact of these training programs, including for decision makers, the judiciary and others working in the justice sector, etc.? We'd also be grateful if you could provide the committee with any information, statistics and data on progress achieved on implementing the specific recommendations of the committee during your last review by the Human Rights Committee, given that we're the midpoint for the implementation of those recommendations. Can the State Party also comment on allegations according to which that although there are foreigners, in particular women living in Guyana under their jurisdiction, these foreigners have no access to recourse before the courts in case of any abuses that they suffer? 
I turn now to my questions on the paragraph 10, violence against women and domestic violence. The state party has adopted the necessary legislative text to establish the requisite political and legal framework as a vehicle for the implementation of the provisions of international conventions targeting violence against, violence against women. Against that backdrop, and bearing in mind that the previous set of concluding observations from this committee and recommendations made by CEDAW, may I ask what additional measures the state party has introduced to prevent and eradicate violence against women, in particular intra-family and sexual violence? May I also ask what initiatives have been taken by the state party to encourage reporting of violence against women by the victims thereof? In particular, what steps has the state party taken to improve reporting by tackling social stigma and by improving access to justice in particular to in rural and remote areas of the country. According to a national survey in 2019, more than half of women in the state party have suffered at least one form of violence in their lifetime. Moreover, according to information that our committee has received, it is alleged that there were 28 femicides in 2022. For 2023, the specific figure is not yet known, but it is estimated at being more than 20 femicides that also occurred in 2023. My colleague, Mr. Quesada, may well come back later to this uh, general issue of legal rulings, etc. But on the broader issue of violence against women, the committee would like to know how the state party is seeking to address this issue and how it intends to reverse the low rate of prosecution of alleged perpetrators of gender-based violence. What initiatives, criminal, civil, administrative or other, is the state party taking to prevent and effectively punish femicides? According to information we have received, three sexual offences courts have been established in the state party between 2017 and 2020. Can the delegation provide the committee with information on the way in which these sexual offences courts function, the number of judicial staff serving in these courts and the rate of convictions handed down by these sexual offences courts? May I also ask what measures have been taken to assure the availability of shelters for victims of intra-family violence and their children, and that across the territory of the state party? In particular, can you provide us with information on any such shelters or refuges in rural and remote areas of the country? Can you also provide the committee with data on the type and form of support provided to these victims and how support systems and services for victims of intra-family domestic violence and domestic violence writ large uh, are financed? The delegation is also requested to provide the committee with statistical data on the number of cases of violence committed by police officers within their marital relationship or within their partnered relationship, i.e. how many police officers have been responsible for violence against their wife or girlfriend, as well as any information on inquiries, prosecutions, convictions and sanctions handed down during the period under review. I turn now to the final paragraph that I will be asking questions under, paragraph 11, which deals with maternal mortality, voluntary termination of pregnancy and sexual and reproductive rights. My first question, what measures has the state party taken to ensure the full application of the 1995 law on a medical interruption of pregnancy and to guarantee safe, rapid and effective access to abortion across the entire country, in particular in rural and remote areas? It seems that abortion is provided in good and safe conditions in the public hospital in Georgetown. Nonetheless, we would ask the delegation to provide the committee with data on the existence of and levels of accessibility to centres providing abortion services and providing facilities and help and assistance to women from poor backgrounds to ensure that they have unfettered access to these abortion services. How does the state party guarantee that post-operation services and counselling and advice and advice when it comes to contraception or is effectively accessible, in particular for women in rural and remote areas of the country. How does the State Party ensure that contraceptives and advice is of high quality? The committee would also like to receive information on the levels of maternal mortality, which remains very high in the State Party. We have also received information that levels of breast cancer are very high in the State Party and often do not receive the care that they require. 
often breast cancer patients, do not receive the degree of care that they require. Those are my questions for the time being. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I eagerly await your replies. Thank you very much, Mr. El Khaiba, for those questions. The next speaker on the list is Mr. Helfer. Mr. Helfer, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and good morning and good afternoon to the delegation. Before I turn to my questions for today, I have a follow-up relating to anti-corruption, which we discussed yesterday. The delegation mentioned that the State Assets Recovery Agency has been replaced by several government bodies that have authority over asset recoveries pursuant to statutes adopted in 2022 and 2023, and that civil forfeitures have been carried out by these agencies. Would the State Party please provide information regarding these forfeitures, including the number of cases, the identity of the individuals targeted, and the amounts recovered? Please also indicate whether any criminal prosecutions have been initiated by any of these agencies. In addition, does the State Party consider that these agencies have a positive duty to be more proactive in investigating allegations of corruption? For example, how is the State Party responding to allegations of corruption that have become publicly known, such as the detention of Ms. May Toussaint Jr. Thomas, a senior public official at the Miami airport in the US on April 8th of 2023? Uh, are the authorities of the State Party investigating this incident? And if not, why not? Let me turn now to issues 12 and 13 on the list of issues concerning the right to life. The committee appreciates the state party has removed the mandatory death penalty and that a moratorium on executions has been in place since 1997. However, we are concerned that Guyana retains the death penalty for certain offenses that do not meet the threshold of the most serious crimes under Article 6 of the Covenant, such as treason and hijacking or piracy relating to an attack on a vessel. The committee is aware that death sentences to continue to be imposed by the courts for these offenses, including as recently as 2023. In, ad in addition, in Gordon et al. versus the state, the Guyana Court of Appeals declined to find the death penalty unconstitutional. The committee is also aware that government officials have adopted divergent stances on capital punishment. For example, in 2018, the former Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu criticized the death penalty moratorium. And more recently, the Attorney General supported a 2023 appeal against the constitutionality of the death penalty, while the Director of Public Prosecutions considered such an appeal inappropriate. Yesterday, the delegation indicated that the abolition of the death penalty will be discussed during the constitutional reform process held this year. How will the State Party ensure that the government maintains a consistent and proactive position in favor of abolition. In addition, will the constitutional reform process affect the state party's pledge to accede to the second optional protocol on the abolition of the death penalty, a recommendation it agreed to follow at its most recent UPR review? The committee understands that as of 2022, 17 people were under sentence of death. Does the state party provide a procedure for individuals sentenced to death to seek a review of their convictions and sentences based on newly discovered evidence of innocence? Such a procedure is contemplated by the committee's general comment number 36 on the right to life. If such a procedure exists, what remedies are provided to persons who are found to have been wrongfully convicted? In particular, does the state party provide compensation to such persons as indicated by Article 14, Paragraph 6 of the Covenant. Turning to Issue 13, the Committee recognizes that incidents of pol police brutality have decreased over the years. However, we re remain concerned by the persistence of excessive uses of force by the police and security services, including extrajudicial killings. For example, on May 15, 2021, Peter Headley was fatally shot by a policeman while being driven to the police station. In May 2023, Dean Raj Singh was shot and killed in Roomveld while responding to a reported, uh, while police were responding to a reported domestic violence incident. And in June 2023, Quindon Bacchus was shot and killed during what the police claimed was a sting operation. The committee has also not received updates on investigations into allegations 
of extrajudicial killing that took place between 2002 and 2006, as requested in the list of issues. In 2018, the state party announced that a presidential commission of inquiry would investigate these allegations. Please comment on the substantive progress made by this commission. Please also describe what measures the state party is taking to prevent extrajudicial killings, especially those committed by the Guyana police force, and to ensure effective and transparent investigations of allegations and to punish the responsible parties. The committee has received reports of disproportionately high rates of racial profiling and extrajudicial killing of Afro-Guyanese citizens. Please comment on these reports and explain what measures the government is taking to address these practices. Lastly, please describe the status and functions of the Parliamentary Standing Committee to oversight the security sector mentioned in the State Party's report. We would appreciate receiving specific information on how the Standing Committee oversees the security sector and whether it monitors compliance with Guyana's human rights treaty obligations, including relating to extrajudicial killing. Those are my questions for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Helfer, for those questions. The next speaker on my list is Mr. Gruja. Mr. Gruja, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. I, in my turn, would like to bid a very good morning, good afternoon, as appropriate to the delegation. I'll be asking you questions under paragraph 14 and 15. Paragraph 14 is about the environment, and I note the information provided by the State Party in its report, particularly, particularly the reference to the legislative framework, which recognises the right of present and future generations to a healthy, clean and sustainable environment. In its report, the State Party references the Environmental Protection Agency, and as my first question, I would like to ask the delegation to provide us with more information on the functions and mandate of this Environmental Protection Authority, particularly its mandate for compelling different stakeholders to abide by strict environmental standards. I do want to pick up on an issue raised by my colleague or touched upon by my colleague, Mr. Helfer, and it's a second general question based on reading the report of the State Party. I would like to ask whether an in-depth inquiry has been conducted into accusations of corruption by ExxonMobil Guyana in the wake of the granting by the government of a permit to exploit the oil deposits in Guyana. I will now come to some more specific questions. In addition to the Paris Agreement, which the State Party reminded us yesterday they have ratified, Guyana has also ratified the Escasu Regional Agreement on Access to Information, political participation, Public Participation and Access to Justice on Environmental Issues in Latin America and the Caribbean. However, according to information we have received, the plan for the exploitation of gold and oil resources, the production sharing agreement of 2016, has several shortcomings which are of concern to the committee. The first concerns the Paris Agreement. Guyana sold its carbon credits in December 22. We were reminded of that by the head of delegation yesterday and has put in place a low carbon development strategy without, however, informing or consulting key concerned populations, in particular indigenous people, in taking that step. Our second concern, there is activities, particularly by illegal exploitation activities, contribute to desertification, to pollution of the air and of the water. These illegal or uh, in operators do not handle or dispose of their waste properly. And we have several concerns surrounding this, including mercury poisoning in the water and, and in the areas inhabited by surrounding communities, in particular by indigenous communities. The effects of this failure to handle waste properly, including mercury, is deplorable and of deep concern to the committee. And we would like to know more about that. Third concern, oil companies such as ExxonMobil do not interact directly with the people of Guyana. Everything is filtered by the government and the oil companies only interact with the government. The wealth derived from oil and gold exploitation and mining only benefits the richest in society, leaving the poorest in a situation of extreme poverty. 
our fifth concern, the right to consultation and to information by the population at large and by affected peoples and communities in particular is not guaranteed. And often the government seems to take consultation as being a synonym for consent. It doesn't recognize that those two issues are separate. You consult and then you wait for the consent. My colleague will come back on the issue of Ameri Indians later, but at this stage, I would like to refer to the very precarious situation of fishers who have no political weight. They work in the informal sector. They're not represented in decision-making bodies and they are not heard as workers in the informal sector, particularly because they're not members of unions. So in light of the aforementioned range of concerns, we would like to ask the state party to share with the committee how it concretely and tangibly guarantees the implementation of the Escasu agreement, particularly the consultation provisions, as well as the provisions on access to information and access to decision making, and the need to take into account the interests and needs of fishers and other professions and communities affected by the extractive industries and the impact of those industries on the environment. I will now come to paragraph 15, prohibition of torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. And I'd like to begin by addressing an issue that we touched upon in our concluding observations, our previous set of concluding observations, and which was raised by Mr. Helfer. I will mention various pieces of information that we have received and that we would like the reaction of the state party on. We have several areas of concern. All of the following has been reported to us as occurring in the state party. There are allegations of forced confessions extracted by the police, excessive use of force and mental, sexual and verbal violence, including rapes committed against persons held in custody, excessive use of force against children and minors when they're arrested. They're not separated from adults when they're arrested. Excessive use of violence, uh, insults and a brutal approach to LGBTQI plus persons. And that was a concern that we invited vote yesterday. It was raised by my colleague, Mr. Quesada. Our third concern about police behaviour concerns the abuse of the law in the state party criminalising same-sex sexual relations, which is used as a tool to put pressure on persons having accused of engaging in outlawed same-sex relationships and as a tool of extortion, etc. In its report, the state party re partially recognises that acts of torture have been committed by the police, but they claim that all of these occurred under the previous government. And they seem to stick to simply pointing fingers at the previous government. We would like to know more information about what steps are actually taken to react to these allegations or cases of torture involving the police. In particular, we would like more information, very precise and updated information, on the legislative framework prohibiting torture and other ill treatment. And the framework that law enforcement officials have to follow to avoid torture and other ill treatment. We would also like to ask what measures have been taken to prevent forced confessions during custody and to ensure that such forced confessions are not used during trials. We'd also welcome disaggregated and up-to-date information, statistics and figures on the number of complaints submitted before the court citing police and the resultant sanctions handed down where these cases have been prosecuted. And finally, information on the rights of victims and access to civil justice and uh, medical and psychological support measures provided to victims. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Gruja, says the chair, for sharing these questions with us. The next speaker is Mr. Quesada. Mr. Quesada, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Chair. A very good morning, good afternoon to the delegation of Guyana and my thanks to them for the answers that they already provided yesterday. I will be asking some questions related to paragraph 16 of the list of issues. First and foremost, we'd like to reiterate the questions that were asked in the list of issues prior to reporting under paragraph 16, because they weren't answered by the state party in its report. We asked for information about the police complaints service and the police complaints authority. I would like to recall that yesterday, in response to a question on another paragraph of the list of issues, the head of delegation already shared with us some pertinent information, but we'd like the full picture as it were. More specifically, we would like information on the role of the Police Complaints Authority, the PCA, its role in investigation of complaints or reports of torture or ill treatment, also its role in investigating complaints or reports of excessive use by the police. We would also like to ask, still on the Police Complaints Authority, what its relationship is with other investigating organs or 
units of the police. And we would also ask what measures have been opted to guarantee the independence and impartiality of the police complaints authority. In responding to this question, please also provide statistical data on the number of complaints received by the Police Complaints Authority during the period under review, together with the content and the outcomes of these complaints. As my second question under this paragraph, I would like to ask the delegation of the State Party to provide the committee with information on the relationship between the Police Complaints Authority and other state bodies responsible for the investigation and prosecution in criminal cases, in particular the relationship between the PCA and the Attorney General and the courts of the State Party, the Attorney General's Office and the courts. My third question, according to information received by this committee, the current president of the Police Complaints Authority, who has been in that post since 2018, has strongly criticized police behavior, in particular criticizing them for violations of the fundamental rights and freedoms of citizens. In his annual report of 2022, the president of the Police Complaints Authority is alleged to have accused the police commissioner of having violated the law which governs governs the police complaints authority system and accuses the police commissioner of having taken steps to avoid or prevent the police complaints authority from being able to review complaints. Against the backdrop of that information, of those concerns channeled by the president of the BCA, can the delegation of the state party inform us on what measures have been taken or adopted to investigate these accusations levelled against the police commissioner by the president of the police complaints authority? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, says the chair. Mr Quesada, the next speaker on my list is Mr Carasso. Mr Carasso, you have the floor. Muy buenos días. A very good afternoon to the delegation. Uh, well, good morning to those in Georgetown and a good afternoon to those here with us in Geneva. I'll be asking questions under paragraph 17, treatment of persons deprived of their liberty. The has been informed about a long-standing and very harsh and life-threatening conditions in prisons. Several severe overcrowding at around 150% of the capacity and growing physical abuse, lack of access to adequate medical care, portable water, sanitary conditions, and even limited sunlight have, has, have been reported. Population in uh, jails rose from 1,370 in 2004 to 2160 in 2022, a, a large proportion of which of whom were on pre-trial. Despite incidents of deaths in prisons and jails, the report does not inform on, on cases received, investigated, and prosecuted or, or and their outcomes. The committee has been informed also that the main contribu contributory factors for prison overcrowding are the overuse of a pre-trial detention as well as the absence of a bail legal uh, framework particularly in relations in relation to decisions uh, to deny bail uh, to deny bail uh, the creation of the prison visiting committees which were mandated to inspect prisons and investigate prisoners uh, complaint has come short of expectation there have been indications about the lack of transparency accountability and independence of their activity and reports Questions, uh, are all the prison visiting commission committees reappo reappointed by now and installed? What statistics may be derived from their reports? Did the prison uh, parole board uh, suspend activities for some times before no November 2020? Is it now reestablished and uh, functioning since uh, when? Please provide statistics. Another question is whether detainees are always uh, separated from, uh, according to the detention uh, regime. We have heard allegations that children uh, deprived of their liberty are not always uh, separated from adults. In regards to the juvenile uh, system, uh, the committee notes the lack of uh, legal guarantees uh, to ensure that the deprivation of liberty of children is used only as a measure of last resource and for the shortest period. In a presentation by the Attorney General in 2021, he mentioned that there were to be 
transformative, uh, transformational uh, modifications in that legal system and uh, mentioned the, the restorative justice bill and the bail bill, which is uh, the state of that uh, literature uh, of that uh, draft uh, legislation and what are the possibilities that it comes into effect uh, soon enough. Please report advances in the adoption of alternatives to prisons. To prison. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Carrasco, for your questions. That concludes the cluster of questions for Guyana. I'm grateful for the good time management. We're now going to have a 10 minute break to allow the delegation to organize their replies. And I remind the delegation that you have 25 minutes for those replies after the break. being made. Madam Head of Delegation, Minister Gail Teixeira, you have the floor. The volume of questions were asked, I'm not sure I can answer them adequately in the period that we're given. 
because uh, us. But I will try my best, and I hope that the committee will appreciate that we can provide post today data that may take too long to read. On the issue of gender equality, Guyana has made tremendous strides, and we have pointed out that in our report, um, between 20, 2000 and 2023, as I've said, a lot has happened. So that women in leadership, 39% are members of parliament. It started out at 35% in 2020, with a replacement of two male MPs with female MPs, we're now at 39%. And may I also add that not only 39% are female, but in our parliament, 12% of the members of parliament are of indigenous descent and origin. Um, this is especially uh, important in our diverse culture. Regarding the issues of women in the judiciary, we have information to show that there are eight female judges, um, two female commissioners of the judges of the land court and 21 female magistrates. The females dominate as magistrates in the, in the judiciary and they also are represented as permanent secretaries, heads of departments and also agencies. Certainly, we recognize that there are women who are still, because of poverty, because of, of economic circumstances, have not been able to reach uh, their, their correct place in the society. And therefore, one of the interventions by the government has been to invest in training and training. And so with the goal project, I reported to you yesterday in my presentation, 21,000 people have been trained in a variety of courses from certificate, diploma, degrees um, across all 10 regions of Guyana, and 60% of those are female. The WIN program, which I also referred to yesterday, shows the number of women who go through that program and who have been trained in the last few years, particularly in relation to setting up small businesses, uh, business incubator, and being able to uh, access small loans, et cetera. So the 1,000 women in the last, uh, since we've introduced the WIN program, have been able to acquire not only skills, but being able to have access to business and creating businesses. The WIN program also has, has uh, reached 11,670 women from across the country with no formal training, were trained to in vocation areas. Out of a sample size, 45% gain employment, while 25% started their own businesses. We, we believe that uh, these opportunities to ensure that women are trained. I also reported yesterday that in our teacher training college, we have the largest intake of 5,000 in this school year, and that, as usual, the number of teachers are majority female. The public service is majority female um, of in Guyana, as in many parts of the Caribbean. And so the challenges that women face, of course, as all women, particularly the fact that we have a high level of single parents in our country, not necessarily biological mothers, but uh, aunties, grannies, and others that take care of children, that a number of interventions have taken place in the social welfare programs to ensure that um, they are able to access public assistance and other forms of assistance with children. One of the issues, of course, for women uh, that, that is important is access to daycare services, and this is something that um, is, is being worked on and expanded. We wish to remind the committee that in the 2022 edition of the Global Gender Gap Report, which covers 146 countries, Ghana was ranked 35th in the overall ranking, moving up 18 points from the 53rd ranking in 2021. Ghana also ranked sixth in the overall regional ranking for Latin America and the Caribbean. And therefore, Ghana has made significant progress towards gender equality. Um, in the same report, uh, uh, 2015, for example, it showed that Ghana had one of the highest um, number of women who own property versus the rest of Latin America and Caribbean. And this is because of the National Housing Program, where 44% of the house owners under the government housing program 
are able to access property, buy property at subsidized prices and build their homes or be able to acquire low income houses. And so 44% of the women of Guyana who have applied for house lots between 2020 and 2023 have been able to obtain, um, have been able to have become property owners, which is a, over a very high percentage in our country and compared with others. The, in addition to that, the Ministry of Housing offers 85%, um, sorry, offers 85% uh, of those who are, are able to access housing subsidies, home improvement subsidies, went to women. And 65% of the four homes, these are homes that are built already by the government, um, these have been uh, uh, given to women. So that there's a very clear policy of the government in terms of enhancing the status of women, in assisting women to be able to, to get their rightful place, not only in terms of education and employment, but in terms of property and being able to set up their own businesses. The issue was raised by the first question, uh, member who asked questions about allegations that foreigners have no recourse before the courts. This is absolutely untrue, absolutely untrue. And that we wish to point to a case uh, where the uh, number of Haitians in Guyana um, who were apprehended by the police, they went to the courts on a constitutional motion and they won the case. There are a number of other cases with trafficking in, in persons where foreign women in particular are able uh, to have protection under the Trafficking in Person Act and be able to also be protected by our laws in terms of appearing in court. Uh, the second case I want to refer to with a foreign uh, woman that, that uh, based on the, the question that was raised, in 2023, a woman who was from Jamaica was awarded $3.1 million after the High Court found that she was unlawfully detained for a period of time. So it is absolutely untrue. And so we reject that completely. The issue of... Um, So the access to the judiciary is available, as well as we wish to remind the committee that we have rights commissions which do not distinguish between citizens and non-citizens in our country in terms of making reports of allegations of discrimination, in terms of gender equality or discrimination, as well as matters relating to children and indigenous people. We wish to point out that all these rights commissions present their annual reports and any purview of those which show what cases have been brought before them. A number of allegations that have been made here today have never been reported to the rights commissions and many have never seen the, the courts or a police station. Um, the issue of the sexual offenses, we wish to point out that in the period under review, 2021 to now, that we have seen an increase in the number of cases coming before the court, as well as convictions, both in domestic violence and sexual violence. And that this is a, a important improvement to show that one, there's an increase in reporting and an increase in the police taking it seriously and taking the matters forward. A lot of investment has gone into training police in terms of dealing with domestic and sexual violence cases. The police stations, in most police stations, the largest stations, have rooms for victims of domestic violence and sexual violence so that they're protected and given confidentiality in their reports, particularly with children. The support that is given to victims of violence there are many interventions that are given in terms of the um, shelters that were mentioned um, in, in that we have two fully functioning shelters operated by the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security in, in, in regions that are coastal, not in the capital. And while there is an NGO, Help and Shelter, that receives an annual government subvention, the Human Services Ministry also has a family care center, which provides safe spaces for children 
for survivors of domestic violence. The, we are also, in addition to the Legal Aid Clinic and the Legal Aid Clinic in Linden, your, the Ministry has also uh, commenced subsidized legal aid, legal aid services under the Pro Bono Initiative in 2023. It is once started very long ago, in which uh, 3,000 men and women have benefited from the initi initiative through free legal consultations via referral, referrals and at outreaches and training. A number of these relate to applications for protection orders and occupation orders. We also uh, offer, in terms of victims of violence, there is the protection of the courts, there is the um, safe houses, as we call them, as well as support to the families in terms of uh, helping them to be able to get out of abusive relations. It's not just about court. It's ensuring that our women are able to escape from abusive relations. The Hope and Justice Center um, has a comprehensive gender-based violence service delivery, the one-stop shop that was opened in 2024, this year earlier, and it is not in the capital, it's in the coastal areas. Safe vouchers are provided for victims and survivors of, of gender-based violence, and these are supported by the private sector. Uh, survivors are also assisted with food hampers and also in support with from the difficult circumstances unit of the Ministry of Human Services providing three months rent for DBD survivors so they can relocate. Public assistance is also given to victims of violence and there are survivors advocates in all the 10 regions of Ghana who have been able um, to assist 3,328 women who were able uh, to get support from the survivors ad advocates. We wish to say that the 914 hotline has been an important tool in helping women to report, or not only women, children, or even men, to report um, domestic and sexual violence. Uh, the last uh, 1,200 women were assisted through the 914 hotline uh, in addressing domestic violence. Psychosocial support is given to victims, and also there has been specific uh, gender-based violence training for social workers, guidance counselors at the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of Health, the main tertiary hospital, the Guyana Police Force, and the Guyana Prison. And of course, there are survivors kits that are provided to victims. So a number of the um, the the number of cases, whilst they have been increasing, we've also seen conviction rates um, being, uh, being uh, going up higher than what it was in our 2015 report to the UPR, where approximately 60% of those who are sexual violence are, are being convicted. It's an important change in terms of the way the courts address these cases uh, 10 years ago and 15 years ago. In the, in the issue of the question asked about um, on the way the sexual offenses court function, I'm glad the member recognized that we have three sexual offensive courts and the Caribbean Court of Justice was high in praise, that's our apex court, was high in praise of Ghana for being the first country in the CARICOM to prov uh, produce and to establish sexual offenses court uh, in our country. The question that was asked in terms of how do the sexual offenses courts function. The courts are fitted with specialists, including psychologists and counselors, who support alleged victims navigate the prosecutions. The court also has special rooms for which victims can give evidence. This room is separate from the general court chambers away from the accused. The victim can also see what is taking place, but is insulated and protected. We also allow in our laws uh, video um, evidence being given. Judges are also trained on how to conduct trials which involve victims of sexual offenses. The question was asked about the number of judicial staff and the rate of conviction. Three courts, um, the three courts have one judge each, and for 2016, so it was an average of 10% conviction 
grade one in 2017, there was an average 25% conviction rate. In 2018, this average was 60% conviction rate. And from the newspaper's reports, we are able to see that that is holding in our judicial uh, area. In regards to the issue of um, medical termination <clears throat> and the issues that have been raised, based on the available data that we have for 2021 and 2023, there have been no reports of major complications following the conduct of medical termination pregnancy procedures and therefore the service remains professional and safe. We must uh, inform the, the uh, committee that not everyone can uh, carry out an abortion in Guyana. Under the termination law, one has to be trained and certified by the medical council to be able to do the procedures. So whilst in a number of hospitals there may be doctors or first they cannot do the procedure unless they have been trained and found uh, uh, competent enough to be able to carry out the abortions. And so this is a matter that is incrementally being dealt with, but that across the country, women have access to post-abortion services in terms of forms of birth control, alternatives. Um, so we do not, do not want, and we never wanted when we brought the Termination Act in that it would be seen as an alternative or a form of birth control. We wanted to enhance and, in, and protect the right of women to choose what they wanted to do with their bodies. Um, the issues that were raised uh, to do with maternal mortality and the levels of breast cancer and the allegation that women do not receive adequate care. If I can deal with the issue of maternal mortality first, um, <clears throat> the Maternal mortality of 2022, according to the Ministry of Health, was 113 to every 100,000. Reminded our population is under 800,000. 2023, the rate has been reduced to 93 um, out, of, out of every 100,000. Um, and so we can, and in 2000, when this report and the concluding remarks were made by the committee, at that time it was 190 um, uh, out of every 100,000. A lot of training and improvements has gone in in the maternal care, training of doctors and nurses, and ensuring that health centers across the country, the primary health care, that are all funded by the government, are able to address issues of pregnant women and to be able to refer them in uh, cases of high-risk mothers or complications. The issue in regards to the interior, that the doctors in the interior locations in Amrinda communities can request a medivac to be able to send out patients that have complications in order to ensure that we reduce any mortality amongst women in far area areas. And so medivacs are paid for by the government and the Ministry of Health to ensure that we're able to preserve life and the life of the mother and the baby. The, um, regarding the breast can issue of breast cancer, there is a unit of the Ministry of Health dedicated to breast and cervical cancer. Um, and five staff, that is four doctors and four specialists um, are dedicated to monitoring and looking at what are the uh, instances and how to improve them. There are no reports of inadequate care, care and there are a number of uh, NGOs who are working with the government in this area. Um, again, you are referring to reports that have never been reported anywhere in the domestic remedies that are available. And so it is difficult for us to answer these when we've never heard of them. Uh, there's been no cases that have been raised. One of the problems with breast cancer is the issue of early detection. And the same thing with cervical cancer and prostate cancer, which are the three highest forms of cancer in Guyana. The issue of early detection of people going to the health centers or the hospitals to be checked. The problem in many cases, by the time women go to the hospitals, that they have stage three and stage four. And so 
the educational program to con to make people and to to educate people to go early to look at the warning signs in, re in relation to breast cancer is very important in increasing the chances of people surviving from breast cancer. The issues that were raised um, regarding the civil forfeiture. We have a number of cases which we could have referred to yesterday, but because of time, but there have been a number of cases and I wish to go back to that issue. Um, first of all, in the acts of corruption, there have been six former ministers and former members of the Ghana Elections Commission who have been charged on counts of conspiracy to defraud the electorate and, uh, and they are before the court since 2021. We also have a document on the police charge for corruption. In 2021, 13 police officers were charged. In 2022, uh, 14 were charged. And in 2023, uh, six were charged. So that there are efforts in terms of these figures may look small to you, but in terms of what was before, this is an improvement in the number of police who are held accountable. One of the questions uh, in relation to police officers, as I'm on that, of interpersonal violence with their partners. I wish to report that 26 police officers have been charged with areas of interpersonal violence with their partners or ex-partners, and have been charged and are before the courts. With regards to the death penalty, we spoke about that yesterday, but I wish to remind the committee, and we reported before the UPR in 2014, that, and we committed in the first UPR in 2010, that we would be amending the uh, act to, uh, to uh, change the mandatory aspects of the death penalty. The 2010 amendment has made it clear that in terms of uh, killing a police officer, a judicial officer, and the line of duty, that this would have the death sentence. And in terms of the hijacking and piracy act, if one kills persons in a boat and murder them, um, that it is also treated as a death sentence. And in fact, there has been a case of seven people were murdered and on a, uh, in a piracy case, and that the, the, the persons who were charged have been uh, charged and sentenced to death. So we have changed the categorization in the act itself, and so life imprisonment and uh, parole are available to all persons um, that have, are before the courts on these serious crimes. And that in fact, um, uh, those who are charged can also appeal their cases all the way up to the Caribbean Court of Justice, which is our apex court. We also was asked what other forms. The clerks have been loath to to execute, uh, to sorry, to to sentence persons to death, give them a death sentence, and generally have been talking about life imprisonment and uh, parole after 20 years. Questions were asked about the EPA, the Environmental Protection Order, and the issue of stakeholders. The Environment Protection Act makes it compulsory for the agency to have consultation with stakeholders, particularly on issues that relate to their, the communities and the people in those communities. Uh, the point was raised that Exxon doesn't consult, and that is absolutely untrue. Exxon does not only deal with the government, the Exxon has had a number of uh, consultations were open to the public to deal with a number of issues. So again, um, these are exaggerations. Um, the, the issue of access to information in terms of the agreements of 2016, these were not made public until 20, 2017, and we have made commitments in the Paris Agreement and the Paris Protocols with the LCPS and we've also made commitments on ethics. The issue that the committee is referring to is a particular NGO that after Guyana had given out 15% uh, of its carbon credits that it received to the 200 odd communities after consulting them, 
on the low carbon development strategy 2030, as well as on the process for accessing the 15% of the carbon markets revenue that Ghana made. This organization went to the ART trees and claimed that there was no uh, uh, consultation with the villagers. ART trees did their own investigation and dismissed that, that it was untrue. The APA also went on, Amarindian People's Organization, as an NGO, went on to play, appeal the decision, and again, they were rejected. And I, I advise the committee to look at a press statement that has been issued by the ART trees in regard to these allegations. Regarding the illegal operations of miners in, in uh, Amarindian communities, we wish to remind the committee that the Amerindian Act requires that anybody operating within an Amerindian community must have the permission of the Amerindian Village Council to mine and to carry out their work, and they're bound by the environmental laws of Guyana and the mining laws of Guyana. But we wish to state that water, that is the rivers, and do not belong to anybody, they're public property. Questions were asked about the Police Complaints Authority and that the Police Complaints Authority, the parole boards, the private uh, visiting committees. Yes, all the private visiting committees have been appointed and reappointed from 2021 to today. They served for two years and they've all been reappointed. The parole board has been reestablished and is appointed and functioning. The Police Complaints Authority is also functioning and that they have powers under legislation which is the Police Complaints Authority Act Number 9 of 1989. The Police Complaints Authority has the authority to be able to investigate all allegations regarding abuse by police, whether it is corruption, taking a bribe, whether it's physical abuse, and even when it is murder. And the figures I gave yesterday on the number of complaints that were brought to the Police Complaints Authority. It is headed by a former retired judge as required by the law. There was a, a point made in the closing of the last speaker that children were not separated from adults in regards to cases uh, where children are either victims or perpetrators. This is absolutely untrue. Absolutely untrue. Children are not kept in, in the same location as adults in prison or in the police stations. They are separated all the time from the adults. This issue of lack of legal guarantees to children, um, some of the questions that we were asked and it's been difficult for us to understand um, because there's much, whether it's the phrasing of the questions, we're not sure, or the translation. But we have a compendium of laws which are in compliance with the Rights of the Child Convention, with the Protection of Child's Act, the New Adoption Act, bring it in compliance with the Hague Convention, um, and in terms of the Development Services Act, uh, et cetera. The, the issue of, um, and therefore, they're constitutional human rights guarantees, and they're also guarantees to do with law. All child victims are, the, are, are under the custody of the Child Protection and, Protection and uh, Care Authority. And so, they manage the care and the, the and monitor the care of children that are in, in conflict with the law, as well as those who would be victims of violence. The, the last question that was point was made, I have reported in my opening statement that the Restorative Justice Act bill and the bail bill what became acts. So the question asked if they're put into effect. Yes, they've been put into effect. They were passed in the National Assembly, as I reported yesterday. And so these are no longer bills. They have been debated and passed. Um, the reports we have on prison, we, we are waiting probably further questions on that. But um, there, there's been an important reduction in pretrial detainees, moving from 21% in 2020 to 13% in 2023. And we have the figures to show that it's moved from 21% 2020 the same 20% in 2021, 2022 was 18%, and 2023, 13%. We also have, based on the UN Working Group on Peoples of African Descent, 
and their uh, condemnation of one of the prisons in the last three years. We've spent a lot of time and money improving the conditions of that prison, including making sure that the prisoners have proper food, proper and safe situations and facilities, as well as to reduce the overcrowding within that prison. And we're also building a woman's prison. The issue was asked about what remedies for persons found to be wrongfully convicted and any compensation. Persons who are wrongfully convicted may file actions in Guyana's court, in tort, or on a constitutional law for any damages they claim they suffer. They have, have and continue to be cases for wrongful imprisonment and malicious prosecution for persons who believe they were victims of misconduct. In 2020, a family was awarded 10 million for unlawful arrest. In 2023, a woman was awarded 2.2 million for unlawful arrest and detention. In January 2024, another person sued the state for 35 million for unlawful imprisonment. These instances were unfortunate, but we realize that there are issues that even states such as the United States and the United Kingdom continue to battle with. And what we are showing is that the courts of Ghana are open and accessible to persons who feel they've been wrongfully dealt with either by the law, the police, or by the courts themselves. A question was asked about the Quinton Backers killing by the police. The police officer was arrested and charged. He's also been admissed, dismissed from the Ghana Police Force. These steps show he was not acting in accordance with the police practice and protocols. The prosecution um, is ongoing of the officer. Um, as I said, there are many questions. I may have missed some because of the rapidity to try to keep up with the questions, but we are open to answer any following questions. Um, there's one more. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Head of Delegation, Ms. Gail Teixeira, for those responses provided. We very much appreciate your replies, and we are also aware that time is not on our side. We have little time in hand to be able to provide perhaps in-depth answers, but I, we do, of course, have tomorrow in hand, and you will also, of course, be able to send any missing information or supplementary information in writing in line with the procedure of the committee. We now have some follow-up questions, beginning with Ms. Tegruja. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Head of Delegation. We are aware of the number of questions that we have put to you, but I think that is indicative of just how keen we are to know how the convention or covenant is applied in your state party. I was rather surprised rather take, uh, by the very specific information that, uh, that we requested and rather general nature of your replies, which is perhaps partially explained by the lack of time. But often you didn't go into detail in your responses. You simply said categorically the information is erroneous, it's false, and then moved straight on. But I do want to come back to some of those questions because, as I said at the outset yesterday, we have cross-checked our information. It's credible. It comes from various different sources. When we choose to ask a question off the back of information that we have received from different sources, we do verify that information. We cross-check it. As I say, we, we check against various different sources. So we're convinced of the credibility of the background to the questions that we're asking you. I'd like to come back, therefore, to this question of the detention of children and the fact that they're held with adults. We had a very specific and categorical response to that concern. And I hope that the delegation will provide additional information to the response provided orally beyond simply saying that the information that we have received is false. I also want to come back to this link between Exxon Mobile Guyana or Exxon Mobile Guyana and its activities in Guyana and its links or ties with the Environmental Protection Agency. I didn't hear, certainly I didn't catch any answer you may have given about the allegations of corruption, allegations that were lodged in 2016. It was alleged that ExxonMobil Guyana had benefited 
from access to the market in exchange for money paid to give it that monopoly or quasi-monopoly over the market. So I'd like to ask if there was an investigation into those allegations of corruption in the granting of licenses for ExxonMobil Guyana and what the outcome of that investigation was. I'd also like to go back to the judicial decisions in 2022 issued by the High Court, which we're able to look back on with regard to the Environmental Protection Agency. According to those rulings and according to concerns that we have received, there is a lot of doubt, a lot of concerns surrounding the Environmental Protection Agency and the way in which it operates. In particular, for example, it's difficult for ordinary citizens to have access to information via the Environmental Protection Agency, particularly information related to ExxonMobil Guyana. So I'd ask the question once again, how does the State Party ensure that the Environmental Protection Agency works independently, in particular is independent from any pressure from uh, mining or oil exploitation companies and how is the environmental protection agency this is my second question on that body working to ensure better access to the public for its documentation records etc thank you very much thank you says the chair thank you mr gruja for those updated follow-up questions which i'm sure will prove very useful the next speaker on my list is mr helfer mr helfer you have the floor Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the responses to the delegation regarding the death penalty, uh, but there are still two issues that on which I would appreciate, we would appreciate additional clarification. So the constitutional reform process that is being held this year, it would be especially useful to know how the state party plans to have its officials maintain a consistent and proactive position in favor of abolition of the death penalty. So as I mentioned in my initial remarks, we have uh, reports of a number of different uh, high level officials taking divergent positions with respect to the propriety of the death penalty in a number of different instances. And since the state party has made a commitment to uh, to uh, accede to the second optional protocol, which precludes the death penalty in all circumstances, it would be especially helpful to know how it is going to lead or, or um, manage the reform process in a way that will allow for the government to take a consistent position in favor of the criminal uh, code amendments. I also have a follow-up. I did not hear a response with respect to those individuals who are currently detained uh, under sentence of death uh, in detention facilities uh, uh, imprisoned in, in Guyana. As the delegation may know, there are quite a few instances where uh, individuals who have been sentenced to death or for other serious crimes uh, are uh, subsequently become aware of new information that suggests uh, that they may in fact be innocent of the offenses. Uh, that can be DNA evidence, it can be new witness testimony, it can ver a variety of, of different things. And uh, the committee's general comment on the right to life has made clear that states parties should provide uh, some mechanism for review and reconsideration of sentences in light of that newly discovered evidence. And if there has been a miscarriage of justice to provide compensation to uh, individuals who were wrongfully convicted. And so my question is, does such a procedure exist in Guyana? And if so, what sort of remedies uh, are provided to those individuals who have proven that they are innocent? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Helfer, for those follow-up questions. The next speaker on my list is Mr. Quesada. Mr. Quesada, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and my thanks also to the Head of Delegation for her replies. Nonetheless, I do want to underscore a particular point with regard to the complaints procedure for the police. Uh, clarification was provided that the PCA is an independent body that was established by law, that its director is a former judge, as provided for by the law, which provides guarantees of independence and impartiality. 
However, I'm still not entirely clear as to what the mandate powers and authorities, authority of the PCA is and what exactly it is empowered to do when it receives a complaint or is made aware of illegal, illicit activities by the police or activities by the police that violate the law. What does it then do? We have understood that it can receive reports of complaints of all kinds related to police behaviour, police conduct, but I'm still unclear as to what it can do to provide resolution. What happens when it arrives at the conclusion on the basis of a complaint or report that a police officer has is indeed responsible for the crime or the violation? What can it then do? And that is why I asked one of my initial questions to which I didn't get an answer, which is what are the, the links between the PCA and the Attorney General's office and the courts? Uh, and again, I underscore the point about what does the PCA do and how does its relationship with, for example, the Attorney General's office come into play when they find that a police officer is at fault? Does the PCA report its finding to the courts? Does the PCA have the power to impose sanctions itself, perhaps administrative sanctions? What can it do? And also a related question with regard to the mandate of the PCA, I asked a question about follow-up of an accusation of the chair of the PCA who publicly accused a pol the police commissioner of standing in the way of the PCA being able to carry out its role and to review complaints lodged against police officers for their conduct. A direct accusation of the police commissioner having uh, transgressed the law that was supposed to allow for the free activities of the PCA. I'd like an answer to that question if I may. Thank you very much. Thank you, says the chair. The next speaker on my list is Mr. El Haiba. Mr. El Haiba, you have the floor. Thank you, chair. And my thanks also go to Her Excellency for the information that she has provided us with thus far. But I am in a similar boat as my colleagues, uh, in particular as my colleague Ms. Tigruja and her concerns about the way in which certain questions were answered. I have two follow-up questions to ask from my side. First, you said that the law provided for training requirements for staff, civil service officials, etc., but I'd, and particularly for medical staff. So I'd like to understand what explains the difference then in delivery of services, particularly abortion services, in between the capital and rural and poorer areas of the country, where there seems to be a major discrepancy on the quality and the conditions of voluntary interruption pregnancy or abortion services. The committee also asked a question about what steps are being taken to increase or improve women's access to sexual and reproductive health services, particularly in rural areas. On the breast cancer issue, we do have data, we have statistics, we have numbers. And I would like to know what statistics and numbers are held by the relevant authority of the state party with regard to breast cancer numbers etc. I'd also welcome information on the number and nature of medical screening centres and prevention centres which allow for an early detection and provision of appropriate care for sufferers of breast cancer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Mr El Khaiba for those follow-up questions, of which careful note I'm sure was taken. The next speaker on my list is Mr. Carazzo. Mr. Carazzo, you have the floor. I am much obliged to you, Chair, and I also thank the delegation, although I share the same concern about the way that our sources and the reports that we have received have been dismissed to a certain extent out of hand with references to the credibility of our sources who provided us with reports and information. That doesn't allow for a very positive dialogue when there is such a confrontational response, I fear. The head of delegation referred to several improvements made in one prison without naming said prison. 
According to information we have received, there are two prisons in Guyana which have been in place for many decades now, not been renovated for many decades. They're in a dilapidated state in Masuruni and Ruyusang. And so I'd like to know which of those two prisons that has been renovated and improved the minister was referring to. I think reference was made to improvements in terms of infrastructure and service delivery to detainees. But again, which specific prison was reference being made to? The countries, uh, it, with regards to Guyana and its wider role in the region, uh, many of us have been struck by the fact that there has been the huge oil reserves have been found recently in Guyana, which will give a major boost to income for the country, given the sheer magnitude of the reserves. And we wish Guyana every success in successfully managing this new black gold that it has struck, and it will redound to the benefit of the people at large. Many countries in our region are familiar with oil resources and how this sometimes falls short of actually tackling poverty. And so we have a question as to how the state party intends to manage its wealth gleaned from oil exploitation, from oil drilling, etc., to make sure that it is available to all in society, including tackling poverty, particularly given that Guyana is a fairly new member among the ranks of oil producing countries. It's a major windfall. So given the major windfall that is expected, we'd like to know more about the plans to make sure this is properly invested in all the people of Guyana to boost living standards etc and to boost indicators particularly poverty indicators which will depend a great deal on the way in which that wealth is distributed thank you very much thank you very much mr carazzo says the chair that was the last of the follow-up questions for the delegation so without further ado madam of head of delegation we give you back the floor to answer those follow-up questions thank you members who've asked the questions um the issue of erroneous allegations, for us sitting here, it is difficult to answer some of these issues which we've never heard or seen of before. The point I made was that a number of the references made to allegations by different committee members have not surfaced in Guyana, nor have they been taken to the police or to the rights commissions or any other complaints body, so that we would be more than willing to investigate, to follow up on any of those. And if the committee could provide us with that, we'd be more than happy to follow up after the review of Guyana. But that we, we cannot be respected to answer something we've never heard of before. The detention of children with adults, let me explain. The, the Juvenile Offenders Act makes it very clear that the, the children were there to be held, and there's a special holding center for children who are waiting trial and who are waiting to come out uh, from a sentence that they may have had. The law says very clearly that if they reach the age of 17 and they have not completed their sentence, then they're moved to an adult prison. And, and also they're kept separately from the, um, from the adults. So that I, again, these allegations may be more than interested in all these cases, so we can try to rectify. The issue for our country is that we must be able to address, and so we are willing to address these issues once we have the information. The issues to do with Exxon Mobil links to EPA. Um, the EPA is covered by statute, and it's also even in the Constitution. The protection of the environment is part of our Constitution. We have taken very seriously the protection of the environment. And therefore, the fact that Ghana is one of the uh, countries intact deforestation, uh, in fact, um, sorry, intact rainforest, pristine forests, that we have been able to have low carbon development and to trade with our carbon markets when we have so many gigatons that we can, of uh, carbon dioxide that we can store so that we have been good managers and custodians of the environment of Guyana. And the EPA Act has been in place since 1994. So that we, we do not, uh, the linkage with Exxon, I'm not sure what that means, in that in terms of the EPA has brought in 
increased fines for flaring, which EPA, uh, the Exxon has to pay and get approval to even flare above a certain amount. But I am not aware that there is any cozy or special uh, linkage or relationship between the EPA and Exxon. Um, we also want to point out to you that the World Bank in a $20 million loan is assisting the Environmental Protection Agency in strengthening its regulatory framework, particularly with regards to the oil and gas sector, which is completely new to our country. We also wish to add that the, the access to information which has been raised regarding EPA, the EPA is required under law to maintain a register of information which is open to the public. The register of information includes, for example, each environmental authorization granted by the agency and the terms and conditions included, each cancellation, revocation, variation, or transfer of an environmental authorization, each incident or occurrence causing or threatening serious or material environmental harm that comes to the notice of the agency, and members of the public. Um, some of the, the information is available publicly on their website. Some, some of the information is not, as it would relate to ongoing matters or ongoing investigations, as well as what may be concerns of economic security. Our Access to Information Act is modeled on the Canadian model that uh, while economic uh, undertakings are going on, invested, then investment undertakings are going on, these are not made public. Um, the question was asked about 2016 production sharing agreement that was signed and secretly signed. There's been no investigation between 2016 and 2020 of that, and nor from then to now. Uh, there may be uh, many um, concerns that people have and may even be convinced that there was some form of cozy relationship. However, there is no uh, proof, evidence, that we can move forward on this. The question was asked, I believe, in the other one, which I forgot to answer, in terms of the former president's promise to have a commission inquiry into the extrajudicial killings between 2015 and 2018. This was not uh, put in place, and we have not uh, also, as a new government from 2020 August, put this in place. The Questions were asked about the judicial decision of 2022 in the High Court um, and whether EPA is independent of Exxon. Yes, it is. It is a servant of the Guyanese people and the Guyana government in terms of protecting our environment. And therefore, it has a right, as any other third party or second party, to join a case to be able to protect their interest. And so the case that was referred to in 2022, it is it may be convenient to look at it that EPA is on the same side as Exxon, but in this case, it is much more than that, and EPA has a right to be joined as, as other uh, persons have. The question was asked about the death penalty. Um, yes, uh, the question uh, the member asked about the Constitutional Reform Commission that will start in 2024. I'm not aware of contradictory statements recently by the new government on, on issues to do with the death penalty. What I am aware that our government and even the political party behind it has consistently said that this issue will be determined by the Guyanese people through a consultative process. And that is the mantra we use. I'm not aware of any in the last 2020 to 2023 of any divergent views any government officials on this. Um, the issue was asked about the, um, the, issue, the question was asked about uh, the recourse for persons who may be wrongfully accused and wrongfully sentences, sentences and what is the procedure available to them. If there's any evidence uh, a person may apply for an appeal to the relevant court against their conviction or sentence, based on this new evidence. And if a court decides this new evidence does not warrant a new trial or an appeal, a person can apply for this decision to be judicially reviewed. And so there are recourses available 
two persons who maybe feel that they're wrongfully accused, and if there's new evidence that would uh, on, um, uh, show that they were not guilty or not complicit in any crime. The complaint procedure for the Public uh, Complaints Authority, the law makes it very clear that the Police Complaints Authority has the authority to, and it's subject to direction to no authority or person. And so the Police Complaints Authority, authority receives complaints from the public, from family members of persons who may be victims or the victims themselves. It is an open door, they walk into the center and they make their complaint or write to the Police Complaints Authority. The, under the section of the Act, um, the Police Authority must refer to the Commission of, Invest Commissioner, um, of Investigation Inquiry under the Police Discipline Act. The PC does not have power to penalize, however it has the power to investigate and it can call for a coroner's inquest. It also can call on the DPP um, in cases to, uh, to uh, examine the view of charges being laid against the police officers. The issue that is referred to the Commission of Police, this has been an ongoing issue um, in terms of, if I, if I remember and if I, I understand the point that the committee members asking, that there's been a problem sometimes of the PCA requesting files from the police and delays in those files or police complaints authority has sent those files to the police uh, to produce information. This has been a battle from the a problem from the early stage. However, as the PC has developed its own investigative capacity, it has relied less and less on the police files to guide them in their own investigations and the development of their own capacity. Let me just go ahead, I'm waiting uh, for some information on the issue of addressing overcrowding in the places of detention. Um, we have, as we said, taken seriously the uh, statement by the UN Committee on Persons of uh, African Descent who went to the Lusignan prison and basically condemned it in 2018, 2017, 2018. We have completed and accommodating now uh, 1,500 inmates in, two, in six structures. We've already completed um, housing and we have been able to construct new facilities, infirmary, and so on. So there's improvement in the conditions of this, the uh, prisoners. And so there are five new main prisons in Guyana, not two, as the committee member referred to, um, and they are across all the regions, in the uh, various regions in the country. And there's also included in this a female prison, which has approximately 50 to 60 people at any one time. We've started construction, um, construction at uh, the New Amsterdam prison, which has been there from probably the 1800s, and that has also been done, and we're creating a new female prison also at Lusignan. <clears throat> we can go through and provide you with the uh, interventions we've made to improve the health care, the food, the uh, training programs, etc., of the, the prison population in Guyana, including, um, <clears throat> including uh, training programs, uh, uh, providing them with um, school education so they can graduate from high school with literacy and numeracy, as well as skills. The <clears throat> And the, to go on to go back to the Medical Termination Pregnancy Act, the, it says very clearly that the medical personnel must be done by an authorized medical practitioner. And that is the point I made earlier, that the person has to receive that authorization from the medical council with, a, with specific competencies. Where there are theaters, and then, then there are um, a medical termination pregnancy can be con conducted, and only obstetricians are allowed by the medical council um, to be able to do medical terminations. So, in some cases, the 
we don't have as yet in all places the um, facilities for theaters in a number of interior areas. This is part of a program of 12 new hospitals and other hospitals being refurbished across the country so that, and I refer to that in my initial presentation, which will bring uh, the facilities up to being able to provide uh, basic care and essential care at the secondary level of medicine and health care. <clears throat> to do with the uh, cancer numbers that I was asked for, <clears throat> the number of cases across state are 88. This is 29. Uh, 0.1 out of 100,000. In breast, it is 50 cases, uh, 20 out of 100,000 cases. This is for the year 2022. And for cervical cancer, 20, uh, 26 cases, representing 16.2 per 100,000. All health sites across Guyana and the Public Ministry of Health can examine, it can examine patients in regards to breast and uh, on prostate and refer them for further diagnosis and uh, um, treatment. These are figures that are available to us. Um, sexually reproductive health services are available at the primary health care levels of the public health system. They are freely available and it's a matter of choice for the patient which method they would like to use. They're also offered to, uh, there are programs for uh, teenagers who are uh, freely able uh, to make decisions of whether if they're sexually active as to what to use. Um, issues of oil investments and uh, conditions of prison, et cetera. In regards to, we have just, I just commented on the free de uh, uh, the detention facilities in Guyana. Again, if there are allegations of corruption, we would like to know them. And from my records, uh, the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs was set up in 2020, September. And um, we have no we are new ministry, but uh, we don't have any uh, letters or cases being sent to us by the committee of allegations that we could follow up on. And in terms of those that are being made, we would like those organizations to make the information have available available to the government or the relevant bodies so they can investigate them. The issue of the oil investment, I, in my initial presentation, I made it very clear that the budget of 2024, only 30% of that comes from oil revenue. And in fact, I think sometimes we get confused with what our uh, what is the potential for oil recovery in Guyana and what is actually being removed uh, at this stage. We only started with first oil in 2019. So we're very young in this process of the extraction and therefore the flow of revenue. See, it's, it's uh, heightening when we reach to 2027 and 2030, not at this point. However, I reported in an initial presentation that the National Resource Fund was passed in the Parliament, is an act, and I explained that earlier, that this piece of legislation governs and manages and regulates the use of Ghana's oil and gas revenue. As I pointed out, it is run and managed by a number of committee board of directors which does not have any politician on it, nor any government official on it. The Public Accountability Committee, which is similarly politician, no government official on it, and also the Investment Committee, which again has no politician and no government official on it, and that this uh, act is really the Sovereign Welfare Fund of Guyana. So all revenue coming in from the uh, oil production has to be gazetted on a quarterly basis and made public, which it is since that act is passed. The, the, the funds have to go into the consolidated fund of Guyana and that the matters relating to the money and the use of the money is dealt with in the National Assembly, reported to and addressed in the National Assembly. This is a far more transparent process 
and accountability with regards to the revenue that Ghana is making and potentially can make. There are issues where they, um, from the 2017-2018 period, the audited reports, these are given, have been given to foreign auditing companies and which those auditing reports have, are in progress of different years and that uh, there are disputes between the Guyana Revenue Authority or differences between the Guyana Revenue Authority and the oil companies as to what they owe in terms of profit oil, which Guyana is due. One thing I want to, to add to the committee, when I began, I said in the initial presentation that Guyana was one of the poorest countries in the hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere, with Haiti and Bolivia right up until 2006, 2011, and then oil came along. And that has begun to change the availability of money to give us fiscal space we never had before to do transformational projects of roads and bridges that will make communication easier, more hospitals and schools that will provide better services for our people, more houses for persons who are low income and working class people, particularly women and disabled persons. So that we came from a spot in 1992 where Ghana was a failed state. It was a collapsed state. The health and education sector was collapsed. There was no housing program. There were no social programs for people. We've come a long way, as I said, in my initial reports. But we have to use that as a baseline, whether we like it or not, of where we started from. And so we have made tremendous strides uh, against all adversity, actually. It hasn't been easy. And that, as I said in my initial presentation, it is the first time in post-independence Ghana that there's hope and optimism for the future, that we see the country changing and that people are accessing housing, that they never, they, they could not uh, access for years. And this will continue. We luckily we have a country that has land and land we have to protect in terms of our environment, but we also have to help our people uh, live a better life. That's our responsibility as a government, as a people to ensure that. And the Ghana's voluntary national report uh, to the UN in 2023 provide some data on some of these issues uh, regarding our sustainable goals and where we have uh, reached or attained by now. We take seriously our responsibilities, both in terms of our constitutional laws, and we also take seriously the treaty reports we bring before you. The list of priorities that were given to us is what we followed, and therefore in good faith, we answered both in our report in 2021, and we're attempting to answer in good faith here. But we cannot answer for some issues which we know nothing about or have no information on. Thank you. Thank you very much once again to the delegation for your replies. We have a follow-up question from Ms. Tigrusha. Please go ahead, madam. Merci. Merci, madam. Thank you. Thank you very much to madam head of delegation, madam minister. It's very important to hear you and hear your replies to the follow-up questions. I have two comments. Well, one comment and one question, which picks up on what you've just said very eloquently on the very specific situation where Guyana finds itself on methodology, because you insisted on the fact that the information shared with you by colleagues are unfamiliar to you. And I think that Madam Chair called at the beginning of the dialogue yesterday that all of the reports from civil society are public and are available on the committee's website. So you have access to those documents just as we do, and that will help you to become apprised of the information that we 
received as well. So I just wanted to raise that point on methodology. We are not working with secret documents. The This material is open to all. I have a very specific question. And what you just said, Madam Minister, is very important indeed. You underscored, and you're quite right, the particular situation of Guyana moving from a very poor state to an oil producing state. And I think that the questions that we're asking you about corruption and the structures that are being established is part of the idea that this this um, the influence of oil also brings with it some uh, shortcomings. We know that when a state becomes an oil producing country, that there are major influencers that can come to try to um, distort or deviate benefits from those who should receive it, namely the Guyanese people. And of course, this Environmental Protection Agency, according to the public information that we receive that is indeed on the website, one of the shortcomings of this agency, now it's just changed, the director has just changed, and it would appear that the person who was the director of the agency before was extremely competent. And when the, the current party came to power a month after, the director was changed. And one of the uh, criticisms against this new director is perhaps not to be so well versed in environmental standards and to allow therefore oil companies to come into your country and exploit the oil resources without respecting environmental standards that are very high indeed. So I have a very specific institutional question, and that is who chooses the director of the Agency for Environmental Protection? How can we be sure? How are you sure of his or her independence? That can be an answer that you give today or tomorrow if time allows. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Ms. T. Grugio. For your question, I do not see any other colleagues asking for the floor. So, Madam Dele uh, Head of Delegation, we have four minutes. You can use those minutes if you wish. Conclude on this day. The issue of unfamiliarity of some of these uh, statements have been made and we've been asked to issue. Uh, we went through the shadow reports that were made available and posted on the website. And there is no report as far as we're aware that talks about children in, in adult detention. And there was also no reference to vice news and the allegations about the vice president in the submissions by the shadow reports. So that is what we mean about being unfamiliar because we use the shadow reports as a guidance of what to expect by some of the questions. Um, in regards to the EPA and the question asked about EPA and the shortcomings, you must appreciate, I'm sure members of the committee, that this is just to be a new country that is oil producing. And that in fact, the former commissioner or director of the EPA oversaw the 2016 production sharing agreement which has been criticized by all, including my government. And so uh, I think sometimes that uh, these issues become very partisan. The issue of the former director, he oversaw, he was part of the secret production sharing agreement of 2016. And nobody knew about it until a year later when the press, thankfully the media, disclosed um, the fact that the, uh, what do you call, the signature bonus had been deposited in a foreign account by the government. And so the government has a right to replace the, the uh, director. And in fact, the EPA has a board and the board is one that reviewed the application and appointed the new um, a chief executive officer or director of the EPA. I've mentioned already that $20 million loan from the World Bank is helping us 
to set up a regulatory and, and strengthen the regulatory framework of the EPA because the act that was passed in 1994-95 had no brought into line, and this is where the assistance, technical assistance of the World Bank uh, is critical. And 70% 70, 70 of that uh, project is completed is a very rich country, and we've been mainly an agricultural primary producing country. Despite the fact that we have oil now, we have put a lot of investment into diversification of agriculture and the economy, and I pointed out new industries of ecotourism and information-based technology, hospitality, and new areas of uh, agriculture. In fact, Guyana, is committed at the CARICOM level, the Caribbean community, as a lead in food security for the region, for this uh, area of the English-speaking Caribbean. And so we have been very sensitive from 2020 that we do not want a monoculture. We are not going to go down the path that unfortunately other countries have gone, where they've relied on being dependent on oil. We are spending a lot of investment, as I said, in the diversification of the economy. At some point, when oil runs out, as has happened in our neighboring Trinidad, that we are able to stand on our own as a country with a very diverse economic base. And hence, that also um, relates to our carbon markets and the fact that we've been able um, to have carbon revenue from our, our protection of the environment. And so, we do not wish to fall prey uh, to the experiences of other countries. We are trying very hard to create the legal infrastructure, which we've done with the Natural Resource Fund and the Local Content Act to make sure that Guyanese benefit through the uh, sectors, the private sector, so that we do not become dominated by persons who are only an exclusive oil with oil and gas and and leave nothing for our people in terms of skills training, opportunities, etc. Oil gives us the opportunity to have the fiscal space we never had to invest in these areas of transformational infrastructure. And this is supported by a number of international financial institutions. We recognize the sensitivity of what we're doing and that we're trying as best as possible to ensure that our people benefit. The fact that our budget this year, that I gave the figure for the increase in education health, and I wish to refer to um, the commitment made by Guyana through its prime minister, um, Mr. Mark Brigadier, retired, uh, Mark Phillips, that we made five pledges at the 75th anniversary of the uh, United Nations Human Rights Declaration. One was to continue to protect and use our low carbon development strategy as its contribution to climate change and protection of planet Earth. Two, as a new non-permanent member of the UN Security Council to protect international rule of law and the principles of multilateralism. Three, to continue to incrementally increase our budget support for education, health, housing and water, social protection, and the development of our indigenous communities by X percent annually to ensure that no one is left behind. Four, to continue to build institutional capacity of our constitutional oversight bodies, in particular the electoral management body and the judiciary. Five, continue to build the institutional capacity of the national mechanism for reporting and follow-up on Guyana's human rights treaty obligations. Mr. Madam Chairperson, um, on the latter point of the national mechanism, we have held workshops in the last two years on human rights. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Head of Delegation, Your Excellency Gail Teixeira. This concludes proceedings for today. 
Just to say that we really appreciate how much effort you put into responding to our questions. We know that time is not on our side. And I know I'm speaking on behalf of all my colleagues in thanking Gerna for its efforts in replying to our questions. As I say, that wraps things up for today. We'll meet again tomorrow afternoon, Geneva time. Once again, thanks to all those who've been following this dialogue, representatives from the world of academia, civil society organizations, uh, as well as colleagues in the committee. Uh, we are also thanking those and acknowledging those who are following us online. Our thanks also go to the conference services, to AV services, to technical services, for, to the interpreters. Thank you for granting us the additional minutes to allow the dialogue to wrap up for this afternoon. And thanks also go to the Secretariat of the Committee some of whom are sat here on the podium with me. And particular thanks to my colleagues in the committee for their questions and for their dedication and input into this interactive dialogue. Thank you very much. We'll meet again with the Guyanese delegation tomorrow at 1500 Geneva time. Distinguished delegation, representatives of academia, civil society, and those attending the dialogue, I'd like to welcome you to the 140th session of the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations. This is a hybrid meeting. It's meeting number 4097, devoted to the consideration of the third periodic report of Guyana and the list of issues has been issues have been sent before the meeting the report is available and both documents in addition to the report conducted by civil society can be consulted online during the dialogue questions will be raised on information submitted by the state party, alternative information from civil society and other reports. This is an important opportunity to provide clarification. Head of delegation, head of parliamentary affairs and governance, Mr. Gail Teixeira, as well as the permanent representative here in Geneva, Vivian McDonald, as well as sharing greetings, we would like to give the floor to the delegation for 15 minutes in order to give opening remarks. Then we will hear from colleagues on the speakers list. 
And after that, the delegation will have 10 minutes in which to organise their replies. They will then have 26 minutes to answer the questions raised. I have to also bear in mind that we are facing a greater challenge in a hybrid meeting in order to ensure that we respect the time allocated and cover all of the themes. I'd like to refer to Mr. Bulkan from your country, who was a member of the committee and also vice chair of the committee. He was rapporteur for communicate, urgent communications and he also supported very important legal positions for the committee. And he's remembered as a very professional colleague who we continue to miss. Without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to the head of the delegation, Gaelic Tishara. Good morning from Guyana. I wish to thank the Human Rights Committee for facilitating Guyana's presence in this hybrid form over the next three days. With me today, I have 10 members of the National Mechanism for reporting and following up of our Human Rights Treaty obligations, which was reported on in our third report. The NMRF continues to function and has played a critical role in the preparation for our review. This mechanism has provided country with limited human resources to coordinate amongst the various bodies, develop and evaluate progress made, and identify where there are still deficiencies. I wish to introduce our representatives here with me to support me, including members of my own staff, but also representatives of the Attorney General's Chambers, the Ministry of Health, the Trafficking in Persons Unit of the Ministry of Home Affairs, Spotlight Program, Ministry of Human Services and Social Security, Ghana Prison Service, the Ministry of Armenian Affairs, the Deputy Commissioner of the Ghana Geology and Mines Commission, the Senior State Council of the Office of Director of the Public Prosecutions, and representative of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we wish to also recognize and acknowledge the support of our permanent mission, our permanent representative, as our mission in Geneva, who has assisted us throughout this process and to recognize their presence here with us. Since the submission of our report in August 2021, Ghana has changed and is changing daily, significantly, palpably, and rapidly. Its transformation is notable and been commented on internationally and regionally. From one of the poorest countries in 1992 in this hemisphere, to one of the heavily indebted countries in the 2000 to 2006 period, to now one of the fastest growing economies due to the advent of the huge oil discoveries in 2019 and its production. At the heart of state, the state party's approach is a commitment to maximizing the benefits for all Guyanese. The government continues to prioritize investments in education, healthcare, infrastructure, and housing laying the groundwork for sustained development and prosperity. The government has increased the budget from 52 billion in 2019 to 135 billion in education. This is a 116% increase. Ghana is working towards ensuring that no one is left behind. Thank you, Madam Chair. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Ms. Gail Tishera, for this background information. This will serve as a helpful foundation for this dialogue. We're now going to begin with the first speaker on my list, which is Ms. Tigruja. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And greetings to the delegation from Guyana in the room and those following us in capital. I'm delighted 
with the convening of this dialogue. And so our last concluding observations date from 2000. This is a while ago now. It's been some time since the last report. And I would like to thank the state for the information provided in the report and the measures taken in order to ensure that the submission of reports to treaty bodies be dealt with. Before getting into the questions, I'd like to remind you about the methodology that we will follow. In addition to the information provided by the state, the committee has prepared the review by using reliable, credible sources coming from other UN agencies and civil society. I should add that this is also occurring at an important time for the state party. This is a pre-election time. And with the delegation, we will also talk about sensitive but fundamental issues surrounding the guarantee of free democratic elections, notably the situation of civic space, protection of pluralism, the rule of law, Combating corruption, independence of the judiciary, and also combating all forms of discrimination, which of course for us are the guarantors of free democratic elections. I'd like to take this opportunity as well, like Madam Chair, to hail the masterful uh, mandate between 2019 and 2022 by Mr. Arif Christopher Vulcan. His intellectual finesse, his rigour and his humanity to combat against discrimination and inequality and protect the most vulnerable groups and preserve the rule of law make Mr Vulcan one of the best human rights experts that I've had the good fortune to work with and I'm delighted that he can continue his work within the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Having said all that, I'm going to address paragraphs one and two of the constitutional framework and I'm not going to I'm going to tackle them all together I'm not going to distinguish paragraph by paragraph so I'd like to highlight the measures taken to implement our previous concluding observations adopted in 2000 I will some issues will be adopted more specifically by my colleagues such as the death penalty equality between men and women or the use of excessive force by the police questions surrounding justice or the situation of pe Indigenous people. These are all issues of concern for our committee. But for me, right at this moment, I will concentrate on three aspects. First, the drafting of the State Party report itself. And one of our committee's recommendations, we asked the state to include civil society. But in the report sent for this dialogue, the state indicates that civil society was not involved as much as it should have been. Yet the state does not explain why not and what hampered greater openness with civil society when it came to drafting the report. So I wonder if you could enlighten us as to why this was the case. Secondly, implementing in domestic law findings adopted by our committee on the basis of the optional protocol. If I'm not mistaken, there are a dozen findings by the committee on Guyana. The lion's share of these focus on the right to fair trial in connection with the death penalty. And we'll come back to this during the dialogue. But at least one of the findings, Gonzalez versus Guyana in 2010, concerns procedures for access to nationality for the author of the communication, who is Cuban, a, a Cuban national married to a Guyanese woman. And the committee found a, a violation of Article 17 of the Covenant. On this point, then, I have a few questions, notably on the implementation of our decision. And with this communication in particular, my first question on access without any grounds for discrimination to nationality for a foreign national married to a Guyanese person. Has this been tackled? Has it been sorted? B, more generally speaking, in, have you any internal mechanism to implement the findings of the committee? And what is the legal standing or the legal value of the findings of this committee in domestic law? 
Third question, what measures are taken to disseminate um, the mechanism for individual communications? It seems that there are very few disputes that are raised. How does the state explain this? Is there a lack of knowledge about this optional protocol and the opportunity to submit communications? And then finally, is the state considering removing the reservation it, it um, submitted in 1999 when it acceded to the optional protocol, which limits the personal material competence of the committee by preventing it from being applicable to persons on death row for um, betrayal or treason. Some states such as Denmark, France, Germany, Netherlands, Norway and Spain had submitted objections to that reservation because it's not in step with the goal of the optional protocol. So the question is quite simple. Has the state party paid heed to these objections and uh, taken steps to withdraw the reservation. And finally, this is this final question is connected to something said by the Madam Head of the Delegation. You mentioned the situation following the interim measures that were issued by the International Court of Justice on the 1st of December 2023 and the referendum organised by Venezuela on the 3rd of December concerning Esequibo. The committee obviously followed the situation with great concern and we'd like to know if this very tense political situation between the two states has had an impact on the constitutional framework applicable in Guyana, such as the declaration of a state of emergency or any other aspect that the delegation would like to share with the committee. I thank you, Madam Chair. Muchas gracias a usted. Thank you, Madam Tigruja, very much. Now, let's listen to the next speaker on the list. Mr. Carrazzo, you have the floor. Good afternoon to everyone in Georgetown, the minister and the ambassador, and um, welcome to this meeting. My comments this afternoon will continue to address the legal framework of the Civil and Political Act developed in Guyana. I will present in English. Guyana included the covenant, which the country had promptly ratified in 1977, into the Constitution of 1980. Article 154 of the Constitution provides for the executive, the judiciary, the legislature, and the administration to uphold the international conventions it contains. The covenant, as other similar treaties, has supremacy status. Articles 138 to 149 in the constitutions, in the constitution recognize and protect rights similar to those articulated in the past. Despite that, the people of Guyana continue to face several, uh, several challenges to the realization of their rights under the ICCPR. As mentioned, there has been no inclusion of civic society organizations in the formal structure for the promotion and defense of human rights. To the question of how receptive are courts uh, to human rights arguments, the committee has read that overall it appears that while courts can be receptive to them, they are reluctant to encroach on legislative autonomy. And to the question if there is a commitment by the government of Guyana to human rights and to the covenant, and whether there has been a transformation in the countries uh, to, in the country towards greater use of uh, human rights, we have received uh, reports that their knowledge, uh, that to their knowledge, there has been no explicit commitment of uh, or to the ICCPR specifically. Uh, in 2022, positively, Guyana accepted a majority of the 190 recommendations stemming from the Universal Periodic Reviews Review, and also Guyana became the 13th nation to join the U.S. Southern Command Human Rights Initiative, committing to human rights engagement, cooperation, and integration. 
Two issues, uh, Madam Minister and Delegation, attract negatively the attention of the committee, which deplores that there has been no references to them in the state report and wishes uh, this committee that their imminent re review be commented by the delegation as well as uh, comments on the instance in instances in which they have been used. I refer to Article 154A6 of the Constitution, which provides that the state party may divest itself or otherwise limit the extent of its obligations under the covenant. And to Article 154A2, which indicates that the interpretation of uh, such article may restrict the application of the covenant within the national legal framework. Questions, which are the broad-based and expansive electoral reform and constitutional reform that the government has announced? In which manner are judges, uh, prosecutors, and lawyers in Guyana exposed uh, to human rights law during their training? Are there prospects uh, for the creation of a constitutional court? Are there prospects uh, for the inclusion of civil society organization in uh, the structure for the promotion and the defense of human rights? Mm -hmm. Now I go on to uh, the issue of uh, non-discrimination paragraph uh, six of the list of issues. Uh, from the report, we learn that uh, the Constitution, yes, uh, prohibits uh, discrimination, that Article 149.1b uh, specifically uh, proscribes any person acting by virtue of any written law or in the performance of the functions of any public office or any public authority from discriminating against uh, persons. And the term discriminatory under the Constitution is uh, defined in Article 149.2 and refers to differences in treatment on the basis of race, place of origin, political opinion, color, creed, age, disability, marital status, sex, gender, language, birth, social class, uh, permanent, uh, pregnancy, religion, the religion, uh, belief, or culture. Uh, uh, there is a strong recommendation from the civil society, we have heard, to amend Article 149 to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression and or sex characteristics, sex characteristics. Um, the 1997 Prevention of, Disc of uh, Discrimination Act, which precedes the constitutional amendment of uh, the years to come, 1999 to 2003, protects persons uh, from discrimination in only three grounds, in the ground of employment and related activities, in the, uh, establishing that uh, being part of the indigenous population is a, a is a prohibited or that mentioning being part of the of an indigenous population is a prohibited uh, ground of uh, discrimination and there is also the person with disabilities act of 2010 which seeks to provide for the welfare integration and rehabilitation of persons with disabilities and prescribes a discrimination based on that uh, cir circumstance. Uh, we learn from the report that the Prevention for, of Discrimination Act is listed for review on the agenda. In which stage, uh, we ask, is the announced reform to the Prevention of Discrimination Act currently? Is there a draft proposal? Which additional grounds of non-discrimination does the draft include? Does it deal with non-discrimination based on sexual orientation and identity? Are there instances of indirect uh, discrimination identify and identified? And in which manner does the government attempt to address them? Which are the stakeholders involved in, in the discussions for the preparations of uh, the modifications or are 
uh, stakeholders to be involved, please specify. The police complaints authority is an established mechanism mandated to investigate allegations of failure by the police force of Guyana to adequately handle police reports made by the population, inclusive of reports of uh, discrimination against any citizen, reports of abuse, uh, violence, and death. Uh, but as it happens with other uh, circumstances, the the quantity, the case, the quantity of cases, quantity of uh, investigations are relatively uh, very low. The UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has, as mentioned, historically considered and made recommendations to Guyana regarding representative instances of uh, this pattern of racial discrimination. The question is in which manner? or manners has have the recommendations of the uncert uh, being heeded by the government. There are several other uh, instances of discrimination that have been brought to the attention of uh, the committee. And uh, for the time being, I will uh, end my presentation today and will re uh, refer to further issues in a in the next opportunity. Thank you. Muchas gracias por... Thank you very much for your remarks, Mr. Carranza. Without further ado, we'll listen to the next speaker, Mr. Quesada, if you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. I too would like to greet the delegation of Guyana. To both those in Guyana and those who are here in the room with us this afternoon for this constructive dialogue. For my part, I have a few questions on paragraph four and eight of the list of issues. Beginning with paragraph four, which includes some content on the constitutional and legal framework for the implementation of the covenant. First, in the list of issues in paragraph four, specifically, the state was requested to provide information the measures that were adopted in order to uh, guarantee that the Human Rights Commission operates in keeping with the Paris principles and whether there were any plans to require accreditation to the Global Alliance of Human Rights Institutions, GANRI. And he replies, specifically paragraphs 45, 46, and 47 of the third periodic report the state party indicated that the government wishes to set up the Human Rights Commission and to then accredit it within Ganre, but that the current constitutional provision for appointing the chair or president has prevented this, given that in order to be appointed, the leader of the parliamentary opposition must present six names among them. The president of the government will then choose the president of the commission, which had not happened by the time the report was presented. So would the delegation of the state party kindly inform us if between August 2021 and today, there has been any progress in setting up and making the Human Rights Commission operational? And what is the current stage of that process? Additionally, we have understood that the Guyana Constitution provides for the establishment, along with the Human Rights Commission, of three other important commissions whose goals are to strengthen social justice and the rule of law. They are the Commission on Women and Gender Equality, the Commission of Indigenous Peoples, and the Commission on the Rights of the Child. The committee would like to know, please, what is the current situation of these three commissions? Are they operational? Have their authorities been appointed? And third, we would pretty sure appreciate it if the delegation could uh, provide a brief description of the functions of the Human Rights Commission, outlining its makeup as well as its uh, competencies and uh, attributions. 
and we would like to reiterate our concern to know if it has become operational. Now I will turn to paragraph eight. Paragraph eight is on non-discrimination. In the third periodic report, the state party replied to some of the questions made by the committee in this area. They mentioned the decision of the Court of Justice of the Caribbean in the case McEwen and others, which led to the decriminalization of cross-dressing. However, there is still lack of information about other questions that we presented, which is why we would like to reiterate our request for information on the investigations that were carried out on the ill treatment of transgender persons in police custody and in prison. Additionally, the state party has not provided information on the lack of investigation of all the complaints of discrimination and violence against the LGBTI community members, including murders. On this last, the state party in the periodic report expresses that there are very few cases presented in the police complaint services, but they do not provide details about the outcome of the corresponding investigations on these few cases. Additionally, uh, regarding the measures adopted to uh, postpone articles 352 to, five, to 354 of the criminal code, which criminalize as
comments regarding the uh, questions that were asked by the first person to do with um, in the space for civil society and the guarantee of free and fair elections, etc. We had made it clear that uh, the government, after a five month delay in the declaration of the results in 2020, came into office on August the 2nd, 2020. And we received the request by the ICCPR for a submission of our report um, in a particular period of time. We therefore tried to comply with the request of the ICCPR and not to be found being delinquent. And so we held consultations with the newly formed uh, ministries in some case like ours, as well as the staff of the other ministries to try to ensure that we were able to respond in time. This has not been the case regarding our other reports to the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption, our reports to the UN Convention Against Corruption, and the work that we've done in preparing the report for the Rights of the Child Convention. So this was a particular instance within a short period of time we had to prepare this report and submit and the period while the government was transitioning uh, into office. So that's the explanation. There was no deliberate intent to leave out civil society uh, in the case of the preparation of the August 2021 report. Regarding the issue of the optional protocol and our reservations, we wish to remind the committee that this reservation did not came from a parliamentary resolution. And therefore, at this point, because the issue of the death penalty has not been removed from either the constitution or statute, that this would matter would have to go back to the parliament. As I said in my opening remarks, that we are beginning the constitutional reform process in 2024 with the establishment of a constitutional reform commission to lead and carry out the consultations across all 10 regions of our country. And so this issue of the optional protocol is linked to the issue of constitutional reform. And therefore we will have to await that process, which will be determined by the Guyanese people in their views on what constitutional reforms they want. We had a, such a process in 1999, 2001. And at that time, the popular view was to retain the death penalty. I wish to remind the committee, however, we have not executed anyone from 1997 and the courts have generally and mainly primarily been commuting, uh, issuing, uh, sentences for life imprisonment and parole. So that uh, there is no view in Ghana right now that we go back to executions of any kind. And so it is a ad hoc or informal moratorium that we have maintained from 1997 to now. To further strengthen our argument, the government has put, nor has the prison service nor has the Ministry of Home Affairs put any investment of funds into developing any capacity to execute anyone. There are no, there's no equipment, there's no person trained, there is nothing. And so that issue, we believe is a moot issue until we can go through the constitutional reform process. The issue that was raised about the, um, the ICJ and the Venezuela uh, issue, uh, uh, dispute, we wish to advise that things did become very heightened September to December last year, and that we thank the ICJ and appreciate the ICJ uh, taking principal and forthright position in protecting rule of law in between the two countries. And we look forward to the process of the hearings at the ICG, allowing for this issue to be finally dealt with. However, it's important for me to inform you that on December 14th, 
through the leadership of the one of the CARICOM prime ministers, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, uh, President Lula, um, and also um, with the support of the UN and CARICOM and CARICOM ministers and prime ministers. The meeting was held between President Maduro of Venezuela and the President Ali of Ghana, where it was agreed to continue the dialogue, not on the issue of the, the uh, claim by Venezuela, but to look at constructive dialogue in relation to developing uh, a less fractured environment and one that would allow for uh, better relations uh, between the two countries. As a follow-up, in February, the joint commission between the two countries met in Brazil, in Brasilia, to continue having an open door uh, in regards to relations between the two countries. A comment was made by question question uh, number questionnaire questioner number two regarding the courts being reluctant to encroach on legislation. Um, we find this rather odd because our constitution upholds the separation of powers between the executive, legislature, and judiciary. And therefore, for us, uh, this is the important fundamental feature of our constitution, which we hold dear. Regarding the issues of the covenant being part of our constitution, we have several human rights conventions that are listed in the fourth schedule of the constitution. We are under article 154, the executive, the administrative administration, the judiciary and the legislature must take into account these conventions ratified by Ghana in making decisions. And this has been adhered to by the Caribbean Court of Justice in a number of cases, as which is our apex court, as well as the judiciary in Guyana. A comment was a question was asked about the the USA Guyana South Command uh, Human Rights Commitment. This was done in 2023, and in regards to the commitment made between Guyana and the United States in terms of upholding human rights, and Ghana will not uh, back down on that, and that our own national interest in the region. I have just explained about Ghana, Venezuela, and the fact that Ghana, Venezuela is not only a larger country and more populated, but also highly militarily equipped, which we are not. And therefore, we need uh, countries that will stand by Guyana, and in terms of being able, and we have allies from many countries of the world, but including particularly Brazil, and of course, United States in the region, as well as the Caribbean countries. And therefore, we do not believe this is a matter to be unduly concerned about. A comment was made about Article 154.6, with regards to the government may uh, divest its or limit its application of the covenant. I wish to ask that you continue to read the same section 154, where it makes it clear that only with the vote of two thirds of the National Assembly, the parliament, can Guyana divest itself in terms of the covenant or any of the human rights covenants. Questions were asked about the electoral reform. We reported in our presentation here today that the representation of the People's Amendment Act 2022 and the National Registration Act 2022 were passed after a consultation period of over a year with political parties and civil society actors and stakeholders. And these, these amendments were brought to remove any lacunas and ambiguities in the laws that led to the tragedy of, of 2020 elections. And so the, these two major pieces of legislation went to consultations with civil society for almost a year. And furthermore, that they're in law and they were tested during the 2023 local government elections. 
the local government elections, there were no complaints whatsoever with regard to the manner in which the elections were managed, nor any accusations or allegations of fraud or any um, illegal activity. In relation to the, the Ghana Elections Commission, these are some areas that will require constitutional reform, as the Constitution gives the power to the Ghana Elections Commission to be the sole authority with regards to management of elections. Questions were asked about the Prevention of Dis uh, Discrimination Act, 1997. We wish to report that we are in draft internally and that the draft will be submitted to consultations both within government and civil society. But we wish to make it clear that the draft at present is looking at the inclusion of prohibiting discrimination on sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as prohibition of discrimination against persons. Stop here to say that the, the uh, PDA, the Prevention of Discrimination Act 1997, came before the constitutional reforms of 1999 to 2001 where the human rights section of the constitution is enshrined and people can go to a constitutional court to have their motions heard. And so the PDA was designed in 1997 to deal specifically with work sites, employment, and specifically deals with that area. One of the areas under draft as well in this act regarding strengthening the uh, mechanisms for complaints of sexual harassment and expanding the definition of sexual harassment. So that um, we believe that this draft, when we have com feel comfortable and completed to take it to consultations, we shall. This has been the policy of all the legislation I have, uh, uh, that I have even read out to you, the 27 acts, that they have all been subjected to civil society consultations and consultation with national stakeholders, including specific statutory bodies. We are unaware of any um, cases being brought to the committee on anti-discrimination issues. However, we are aware that there are cases, a case has been brought to the UN CERD with regarding allegations of discrimination. We have answered those allegations in a very uh, comprehensive and detailed manner to the UN CERT. Uh, we have not received anything other than an acknowledgement, and this was uh, since last year. So we are not aware of the follow-up of UN CERT on the issue and the main case that has been, come, has been brought to us. Question number three, in terms of um, the Human Rights Commission, <clears throat> as we have explained, the Human Rights Commission is enshrined in the Constitution. It is made up of the chairpersons of the four other rights commissions. So the commission is comprised of the head of the chairperson of the Ethnic Relations Commission, the Indigenous Peoples Commission, the Rights of the Child Commission, and the Women and Gender Equality Commission. And the chairperson is appointed after meeting consultation with the leading opposition who sends the president six names that are not unacceptable to the president. Based on that, uh, there have been many attempts over the years uh, requesting the leading opposition, and there have been several different leaders of the opposition uh, to submit names the six names uh, for the consideration of the president. This has not happened. And in relation to recent leading opposition, he has announced that he will be submitting names, but that was about three months ago and we've not heard from him on this issue. There were issues raised to do with, so that the mandate of the Human Rights Commission basically deals with um, the as pointed out in the Constitution, Article 
2120 and the functions in terms of the observation of observance of the international instruments to which the government accedes from time to time, including those already acceded to and specified in the fourth schedule. It goes on to talk about compliance with the rights and report the need for any amendment of the law relating thereto. Educate the public. I'm just trying to compress the, the constitutional um, uh, areas of the mandate. Make, re make recommendations to any person or entity, including a ministry or government department relating to matters, etc. Investigate complaints and initiate violations. And there are several more uh, parts of the mandate. These, these human rights, the, this human rights commission will deal with all human rights, but particularly human rights that aren't covered by the Indigenous Peoples Commission and their mandate, the Women and Gender Equality Commission and their mandate, the Rights of the Child Commission and their mandate, and the Ethnic Relations Commission and their mandate. The Secretariat of the Human Rights Commission functions and has received budgets annually so that they're able to function in this year, their budget has been increasing from 25.3 million in 2021 to 33.7 million in 2023 to 32.6 million in 2024. That's for the Human Rights Commission alone. In regards to the issues of Sorry, in regards to the anti-corruption measures, we want to report that, as we stated in our opening remarks, that the Public Procurement Commission was appointed and that it is functioning. The comment that it is slow must be taken in context. The commission, when it came in, found that files were missing, that the past commission, Public Procurement Commission, had removed and disappeared many files, that the commission itself was down to six people, and that they had to reconstruct and hire people and to try to reconstruct files. The commission itself has, in, has been investigating a number of reports that are recent and have not concluded those. We wish to remind that the People's, People's the Procurement Commission is a constitutional body covered by the Constitution in its mandate and is independent from interference from anybody. The Integrity Commission, as we reported, uh, it has been appointed and that it has once again uh, published names of persons who should be declaring who have been defaulters. Work has gone into strengthening the Integrity Commission and its, and its budgetary resources have been increased. We are unable at this point to, to activate the Public Disclosure and um, Whistleblowers Act as, because there are genuine problems of implementation. However, in the interim, any person who is a witness in a case or any person that in order to protect the investigation that are offered safety, safe haven, and are offered protection by the state and the um, police. With regards to the state assets recovery, that <clears throat> wish to assure the Human Rights uh, Committee, the state asset recovery, the act that you refer to, and the state actually had to be repealed. It was a monolithic body in which the head of the state assets recovery could become the chief immigration officer, the commissioner of police, the director of public prosecution, etc. This act has been repealed. However, we have the powers of the um, special organized crime unit, the serious organized crime unit, SOCQ, the customs anti-narcotic unit, KANU, and the director of public prosecutions have been strengthened by amendment to the AML CFT Act of 2022 and 2023 to have a modern confiscation framework 
inclusive of an asset recovery fund, as well as asset sharing arrangements domestically and internationally on a framework for asset management. <coughs> the amendment in 2023 to the AML CFT presents provisions for civil forfeiture. These provisions position Guyana as having one of the more modern civil forfeiture legislations. And we have a number of cases which we can submit to you after today, after today's sitting, to show the number of cases where there has been um, civil confiscation during the reporting period. Comments were made regarding the EITI, and we must um, clarify this. The EIT was suspended and reinstated within six months, and then it has submitted its reports, and it is working on the 2022 report, which is required to be submitted this year. The issue of the Vice News accusation of a Vice News report article on the Vice President of Guyana and acts of corruption. There is no follow-up and because there was no police uh, report made by Vice News or anybody else. And so the police cannot investigate without some form of report of complaint. However, the Vice President has answered this issue publicly several times in the same media that has carried these reports. The Natural Resource Fund, the original act that was passed in 2019, gave the minister, when we were, were in the period of a no-confidence motion when elections should have been held, the Natural Resource Fund of 2019 gave the Minister of Finance exclusive powers regarding the uh, expenditure of the Sovereign Welfare Fund of Guyana. The new act of 2022 dismantles all of that and requires that the, there is a limit of how much of the funds that we make it every year can be expended in order to protect future generations and that this has to be done, one, by officially gazetting on a quarterly basis the revenue from the oil and gas sector, as well as taking to parliament for parliamentary approval and acknowledgement and approval of the expenditure from that fund. The Minister of Finance in this case, were he not to do this, he could be imprisoned for quite a long time. So we believe the new Act of 2022 has greater transparency and accountability and that it has a series of committees, the board of directors sitting there are not politicians, not the names come from a parliamentary. The public accountability and uh, uh, committee of the National Natural Resource Fund also has civil society actors who are nominated uh, to and that the leader of opposition has one name, which he can appoint, not, not political, not partisan, to sit on the investment board or investment committee of the Natural Resource Fund. So that there's civil society participation in the oversight and the um, and expenditure and use of funds in the Natural Resource Fund or what we would call our social welfare fund. Regarding the case that was raised, to do with the Cuban um, marrying a Guyanese national and the um, and and the denial by the Minister of Home Affairs where he went to court. Um, we want to note that the court action between 2002 and 2006 was not concluded as a decision was not given by the judge. During the time and for some time after the Guyanese court suffered from a backlog, an issue which affected courts all over the world. Since then, Guyana passed the 2016 civil procedure rules for the Supreme Court, which has significantly reduced the backlog and now allowed for quick disposal. In relation to the, the, this case that the Justice Singh um, quashed the decision by the Minister of Home Affairs 
and to deny uh, Mr. Gonzalez uh, his citizenship. This is a long time ago, and our laws uh, have not been amended. However, anybody marrying a Guyanese citizen, they have to, they can, they can, from the day they are married, they can apply to be a citizen. There is nothing in our law that says that they have to be here a year, two years, five years, and therefore, there are repeatedly persons who are married Guyanese who are given citizenship based on marriage. You can become a citizen of Guyana by naturalization, registration, or by marriage, or by descent. And so the, um, the, we do not believe that this is an issue any longer in our society. In that case, the, the Minister of Home Affairs lost the case because he did not give reasons for the denial of the request to Mr. Gonzalez. We'd also wish to advise that the judges judiciary undergoes training on human rights and the laws of our country, as well as the covenants that we have ratified. So do the police and all police person recruits go through human rights training program, as well as, I think to make a point, I cannot read that. Um, that the um, that the all police go through human rights training program on recruitment, and that there are layers of training as they go through the service in regards to domestic and sexual violence, human rights. All station sergeants are trained uh, in human rights, as well as the cops squad. Two thousand has trained over two thousand police. Uh, and to ensure that in every station there are policemen who are trained in sexual and domestic violence cases. In regard to the point made of failure to investigate allegations of corruption by the judiciary, we are not aware of any such reports. As far as we're aware, no such allegations have been made to the Judicial Service Commission or even been made public by any journalist or any media house. There's this dissatisfaction with court cases, especially for those who lose. However, that does not mean that there have been allegations of corruption. And if that is so, it has to be brought to the attention of the state and the judiciary of our country. In regards to the LGBTQI and the issue of arrest and detentions, there are, we wish to report that there, there are no such reports that we've received about these uh, allegations. And in fact, a number of the LGBTQI uh, organizations have made it clear that the, um, that they themselves, the numbers that may uh, state that their human rights violations are very, very small, but they admit that they have not made reports to the rights bodies, the rights commissions, nor to the police. And so we cannot investigate those. Um, the The, 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 uh, the point made about Section 352-354 annual uh, in terms of the criminal code, these are areas that um, we believe strongly and some of us believe strongly should be removed. However, this is a matter for consultations. And we would find if we were to consult civil society on this, which we have, several years ago, they are adamantly opposed, the majority, particularly the religious bodies, are adamantly opposed to the removal of this, uh, this particular um, clause in the criminal uh, code. And so, so that we, we have gone through consultations with civil society bodies. What we're trying to do is to slowly, and we've seen through the years, less fears, less paranoia, less 
public, um, how do you say, exposure and ridiculing or vilifying of persons of LGBTQI. There is no discrimination in the government services or the public service or any statutory bodies under uh, that are publicly held by the government of discrimination in the workplace of persons who are LGBTQI. There are also, as we check with the Ministry of Labor, there are also no such reports at the Ministry of Labor to do with complaints of discrimination in terms of hiring. But it is a process we have to go through and that as long as a very critical and important section of civil society, the religious community is vehemently opposed, it will be difficult to bring this amendment into being. One last point, if you allow me, is that the Police Complaints Authority, we have data that we can share with you following today on the number of complaints received. In the last, from 2020 to now, there have been 845 complaints received. A number were rejected. Um, a number of them have gone to investigation. And also, complaints have been sent to the Police Service Commission and to the Director of Public Prosecutions. The complaints that were closed were 491. And so the Police Complaints Authority is a statutory body, not a constitutional body, has powers to investigate. And in the case of where a person may have died in police custody, they have the authority to call for a coroner's inquest um, to determine whether the, the person was murdered or by natural causes, etc. I hope, Madam Chair, that I've answered most of the questions or all. I must confess, if I uh, omitted any, it was by um, just trying to keep up with all the questions and also sometimes trying to read my handwriting after doing that. So if I have, uh, I have omitted anything, it was not deliberate and I'm ready, I would be uh, available and my team to, to respond to those questions uh, again, if they were repeated. Thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, señora jefa de delegación, Gail Teixeira, por las respuestas y también a la delegación. Vamos a hacer, de hecho, algunas consultas de seguimiento por algunos colegas que se han inscrito. El primer orador es el señor Carazzo. Señor Carazzo, tiene usted la palabra, por favor. Muchas gracias. Por más, por más que me esmeré en buscar la traducción para EITI, no encontré de qué se trata y consecuentemente no entendí la explicación que se dio sobre ella. Eh, interesa eh, el trabajo de la Comisión de Relaciones Étnicas eh, establecida en eh, la legislación, en eh, la Constitución, del cual, de la cual se nos informa en el reporte del eh, gobierno, el reporte producido en el año 2022, que había quedado vacante desde el año eh, 2021 y que durante la vacancia quedaba, quedaban limitados sus eh, poderes eh, de acción. Eh, por otro lado, nos enteramos de que la comisión fue restablecida mediante los nombramientos eh, apropiados en el año eh, 2023. Y por último, eh, terminó eh, indicando que el propio informe indica que en el año 2020 fueron 164 casos los que eh, conoció la comisión en un país con una población de más de 800 mil eh, habitantes, de la cual se reporta también eh, por el centro Carter de que es una sociedad que ha estado permanentemente sujeta a una confrontación étnica eh, particularmente sostenida y y de, de cuidado, obviamente, que el gobierno debe ocuparse.
se deje que esas relaciones sanguíneas eh, caminen adecuadamente. La pregunta es, ¿cuáles son los datos de eh, la casuística de esa comisión en los años eh, 21, 22 y 23? ¿Y cuáles son los resultados que se tienen en este momento? Gracias. Muchas gracias a usted, señor Carazzo, por su intervención. Escucharemos seguidamente al señor Quesada. Tiene usted la palabra, por favor. La delegación del Estado aparte por la información que nos ha entregado. Eh, tengo una primera pregunta de seguimiento que más bien es eh, una solicitud de, de aclaración de lo que ya se informó respecto de la Comisión de Derechos Humanos. Eh, por una parte se ha confirmado lo que estaba ya en el informe periódico de que sigue pendiente el nombramiento de su presidente. Lo que según ese mismo informe periódico era un obstáculo para poner en marcha la comisión. Pero por otro lado, la señora jefa de delegación nos acaba de informar que a esta comisión se le han asignado recursos y se ha nombrado una secretaría pero me gustaría saber qué significa eso. ¿Está, ¿Está funcionando efectivamente a pesar de que no ha, sido, no ha sido nombrado su presidente por este problema que hay de falta de acuerdo con el jefe de la oposición? Y al, en el mismo sentido, quisiera también saber cuál es la situación de las otras tres comisiones relacionadas con la protección de derechos humanos en ámbitos específicos. Y la segunda pregunta... Eh, la señora jefe de delegación acaba de dar alguna información sobre el servicio de denuncias contra la policía. Eh, eh, se comprometió a entregar algunas cifras estadísticas. Eh, pero de todas maneras me interesaría eh, saber algo que preguntaba yo específicamente. Si tiene competencia esta, este servicio para conocer eh, particularmente de denuncias eh, por discriminación o violencia de funcionarios policiales en contra de personas LG, LGBTIQI y al mismo tiempo quisiera saber cuán independiente es este órgano. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a usted, señor Quesada. Escucharemos seguidamente a la señora Tigrulla. Tiene usted la palabra. Merci, merci beaucoup à, à, à madame la, la ministre, madame la chef de la délégation pour uh, les, les premiers éléments de de, de réponse, mais il y a des questions que j'ai posées euh, qui n'ont pas, pas reçu de, de réponse suffisamment précise ou suffisamment euh, claire et qui vont au-delà de ce qui a été dit dans, dans, dans le rapport. Euh, alors, je, je note votre réponse sur la question, euh, le, le cas particulier euh, Gonzalez contre Guyana, et je ne vais pas insister sur les questions de nationalité parce que l'on aura l'occasion dans la suite du dialogue euh, de, de revenir sur la, mani donc, sur la loi euh, liée euh, euh, à la nationalité, à la citoyenneté et comment la nationalité s'acquiert. Donc, je ne vais pas revenir sur, euh, sur ce point-là. Mais ce que j'ai toujours du mal à comprendre en lien avec les questions qui ont été posées par euh, Monsieur Carazzo et, et mes questions, c'est concrètement quel est le statut à la fois du pacte et des décisions, euh, des constatations adoptées par notre comité ou, ou d'autres comités en, en droit interne. Donc à cet égard, j'ai deux questions très précises. Encore une fois, quelle est la valeur juridique des décisions que notre comité adopte et que, comment est-ce que ces décisions sont, sont reçues en, en droit interne Et puis l'autre question que, que j'ai posée sauf si j'ai mal entendu, mais n'a pas reçu de réponse, est-ce qu'il existe en, en, en droit interne un mécanisme qui permet à la fois de récolter, de réunir les différentes recommandations qui sont faites, qui sont formulées par les organes de traité, et de les mettre en œuvre, et de les, et de les suivre Donc concrètement, quand euh, euh, l'État qui est parti, vous l'avez rappelé, à, à beaucoup d'instruments internationaux de, de droit de l'homme, reçoit des recommandations, comment ces recommandations sont-elles euh, euh, réunis, centralisés par les autorités et concrètement euh, mis en œuvre. Donc, ce serait important pour le comité d'avoir une vue plus claire de la diffusion en droit interne, à la fois du, du, du pacte, mais aussi des décisions du comité. Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias a usted, señora Tigruya, por su intervención. Eh, devolvemos la palabra en este momento a la delegación que dispone de 14 minutos para dar respuesta a las consultas que fueron formuladas recientemente por los miembros del comité. 
Señora jefa de delegación, la palabra es suya. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the follow-up questions. Um, the Ethnic Relations Commission was a construct that came out of the 1999-2001 constitutional reform process and after a violent period in our country's history. Its mandate and its objective is to try to build ethnic harmony, but also to allow for complaints and redress by persons who believe that they have been discriminated against. The fact that politicians are not on it and that persons come through a civil society consultative process. I need to just take a few minutes to say that in the appointment of the rights commissions, the four rights commissions, the parliamentary consensual mechanism and the, and the constitution requires that the list of entities we will consult in civil society goes through a parliamentary committee. That list requires a two thirds majority of the National Assembly. Therefore, there has to be some agreement between government and opposition or the list is not approved and therefore it goes back to the committee for further review. Assuming that one is able to get the majority, the two thirds majority in the House to approve the list of entities to consult for any of the four rights commissions and one returns, then one goes into consultation phase where civil society goes through its own modalities to nominate its representatives to these rights bodies. It is a long process, it doesn't happen overnight. And many of the civil society organizations themselves are not uh, strong organizations to be able to execute these quickly. Once we have the nominees from the civil society, that goes back to the National Assembly for a simple majority. The next stage is that the president is advised that the National Assembly by resolution has adopted the following persons as nominees. The president <laughs> has no nominee of his own on any of the rights commissions, none. Nor does he have a nominee on the police service commission, but only in the Judicial Service Commission in concurrence with the leader of the opposition, they have to agree to one name. And in the Public Service Commission, he has one name in his own discretion. So these are bodies, both Service Commission and Rights Commissions, all are constitutional, which are protected from interference by the state. The issue that Carter Center reports, they know it well. Project Center was with us since the 1989 in the struggle to get free and fair elections with President Carter. And it was in 1992, we had the first free and fair elections. Carter Center is very well aware of the struggles of our country to restore democracy and how, what, how difficult it has been even after 1992. We have, as a government, the issue was raised at the responsibility of the government to maintain ethnic harmony. One is to ensure that the rights commissions are functioning. Two, with regard to the judiciary that is open and where people can make, bring cases for constitutional, uh, constitutional motion on any of their human rights, including cases regarding the anti-discrimination clause of the constitution. The constitution court tends to quickly hear cases faster than the civil courts. The, one of the constructs the government has, has been developing over the last two years is the concept of one Guyana to try to build harmony between our people with a variety of joint activities, programs that allow people to come together in a less fractured, politically partisan and uh, fractured way. The ethnic, the ethnic issues of Guyana relate more to politics and partisanship than to uh, views of uh, ethnic preferences. The question was asked about the um, Human Rights Commission and to clarify for the honorable member, the constitution requires a human rights commission. The commissions 
is the name and the title. The commissioners, when appointed, make the decisions of the commission under the mandate of the constitution. The second is the, that lends technical and advisory support to the commissioners. But in addition to that, the Human Rights Commission, that is the body, also has responsibility to be the secretariat for the core functions, C-O-R-E functions, of the three human rights bodies, women and gender, rights to child and indigenous people. We have to remember that we're a small country with limited human resources. And so in the constitutional reform, it was thought to be important to make it as practical as possible that the Human Rights Commission Secretariat would be the one to assist the other commissions with regards to their core functions, such as accounting, administration, transportation, etc. But the functions relating to, relating to their mandate in the Constitution is strictly for the commissioners. The other four, four commissions are functioning. We appointed we announced that the Ethnic Relations Commission was reappointed um, in 2022 and is functioning, and that the gap, as was pointed out, between 2021 and 2022, um, they could not make decisions. They received reports, but again, it's the Constitution that demands that the commissioners make the decision and not the technical persons in regarding to how to treat with a case once the investigation is over. That's a decision purely for the commissioners. However, we wish to add that the annual reports of the all these bodies are tabled in the National Assembly and are public documents and posted on their websites so that one can look at the most recent reports of the Indigenous Peoples Commission, the Rights of the Child Commission, Women and Gender and Ethnic Relations. The question was asked whether the PCA is authorized to deal with cases of abuse, etc., brought by persons with LGB, who are LGBTQI. The Police Complaints Authority, under the law of the Com Police Complaints Authority Act, must hear, must investigate all claims by anyone with regarding abuses by the police, corruption, fraud, murder, etc. So there's no, nothing that allows the Police Complaints Authority to discriminate against any persons making complaints. So members of the LGBTQI community are free to, as every other citizen of Guyana, to make a complaint to the Police Complaints Authority regarding any abuse by any police officer, any part of the country, for the Police Complaints Authority to investigate. We also wish to, to just uh, strengthen that, but that the Police Complaints Authority to ensure has to ensure independence and impartiality in its work. It does not fall within the ambit of the Ghana Police Force. It, the program of the PCA is not financed by the Ghana Police Force. The chairman of the commission is appointed by the president and must be a person who was a retired judge or equivalent of such qualifications. The issue of the status of governance reference domestic legislation. As has been pointed out by you, by one of the members of the committee and ourselves, Article 39.2 of the Constitution allows the High Court to take note and apply international law, including the ICCPR and decisions of the Human Rights Committee. And we have a number of cases in the, the Tyrone Thomas versus the Attorney General of Guyana, uh, Chief Justice Roxanne George noted that Guyana is bound by the ICCPR in coming to a decision that the rights of the claimant in that case under the Constitution, the ICCPR were violated. Additionally, the Chief Justice noted various decisions of the UN Human Rights Committee in interpreting and, implying and applying the ICCPR and its provisions. 
specifically the Committee on Communication number 265-1987, uh, A. Bourlain versus Finland was specifically cited. We can send this and other relevant decisions in due course during the review. The issue was raised about how do we centralize and and uh, move forward the recommendations of the right of the UN committees or the other treaty bodies we have us we have ratified. We have reported both today and in our report of 2021 the formation of the national mechanism for reporting and follow up, which is made up of 16 agencies that are responsible for examining the recommendations and observations by the various treaty bodies. We also have to train the members of the focal points who are representing those 16 agencies regarding the human rights conventions that Guyana has ratified. That training has taken place in 2022, 2021, with the assistance of the um, Universal Periodic Re uh, Review Trust Fund and what was called the Georgetown Conference, where members of the, of the NMF RFU were exposed to the Convention on the Elimination for Racial Discrimination and um, the CEDAW. We ourselves as a committee continue training on the various conventions with the NMRFU, as well as the um, development of a template of how we bring those recommendations to the attention of the various ministers, cabinet, and the president. The, so the, we have also reported to the UN, and we made a presentation in Geneva last year on our mechanism, and we participated in Barbados with another program with the UN regarding the national mechanism. So the, this mechanism is Unique in the sense that this is how we, as a small developing country with limited human resources, are trying to keep up to date with one, the reporting on our treaty obligations, and two, the follow up and monitoring of the implementation of the recommendations. And also being able, as a member state, to be able to say that some things are not feasible at this time based on a number of uh, objective factors, as well as in some cases, cultural and other um, views that may hamper the implementation of some rights. I hope that I have been able to, to answer some of these issues and clearly we have additional information that in terms of data that we can provide um, to the committee and we can send out um, to you. Muchas gracias, señora jefa de delegación, y muchas gracias a la, a la delegación por las respuestas que fueron suministradas. Eh, concluimos esta parte del diálogo durante esta tarde. Eh, nos volvemos a encontrar mañana a las 15 horas de Ginebra, hasta las 17 horas. Avanzaremos con las cuestiones 9 a 17. Así que agradecemos el enorme esfuerzo eh, de de la delegación a distancia, la delegación aquí presente, de los miembros del comité, del servicio de conferencias, del equipo de interpretación y de la secretaría en la persona de la señora Hapton aquí a mi derecha. Así que eh, concluimos por hoy la sesión 4097, la reunión 4097 del comité. Muchas gracias. Okay.
1999-2001 constitution reform process and after a violent period in our country's history. Its mandate and its objective is to try to build ethnic harmony, but also to allow for complaints and redress by persons who believe that they have been discriminated against. The fact that politicians are not on it and that persons come through a civil society consultative process. I need to just take a few minutes to say that in the appointment of the rights commissions, the four rights commissions, the parliamentary consensual mechanism and the, and the constitution requires that the list of entities we will consult in civil society goes through a parliamentary committee. That list requires a two thirds majority of the National Assembly. Therefore, there has to be some agreement between government and opposition or the list is not approved and therefore it goes back to the committee for further review. Assuming that one is able to get the majority, the two thirds majority in the House to approve the list of entities to consult for any of the four rights commissions and one returns when one goes into consultation phase where civil society goes through its own modalities to nominate its representatives to these rights bodies. There's a long process, it doesn't happen overnight. And many of the civil society organizations themselves are not uh, strong organizations to be able to execute these quickly. Once we have the nominees from the civil society that goes back to the National Assembly for a simple majority. The next stage is that the president is advised that the National Assembly by resolution has adopted the following persons as nominees. The president has no nominee of his own on any of the rights commissions, none. Nor does he have a nominee on the police service commission, but only in the Judicial Service Commission in concurrence with the leader of the opposition, they have to agree to one name. And in the Public Service Commission, he has one name in his own discretion. So these are bodies, both Service Commission and Rights Commissions, all are constitutional, which are protected from interference by the state. The issue that Carter Center reports, they know it well. Project Center was with us since the 1989 in the struggle to get free and fair elections with President Carter. And it was in 1992, we had the first free and fair elections. Carter Center is very well aware of the struggles of our country to restore democracy and how, what, how difficult it has been even after 1992. We have, as a government, the issue was raised and the responsibility of the government to maintain ethnic harmony. One is to ensure that the rights commissions are functioning. Two, with regard to the judiciary that is open and where people can make, bring cases for constitutional, uh, constitutional motion on any of their human rights, including cases regarding the anti-discrimination clause of the constitution. The constitution court tends to quickly hear cases faster than the civil courts. The, one of the constructs that government has, has been developing over the last two years is the concept of one Guyana to try to build harmony between our people with a variety of joint activities, programs that allow people to come together in a less fractured, politically partisan and uh, fractured way. The ethnic, discrimin the ethnic issues of Guyana relate more to politics and partisanship than to uh, views of uh, ethnic preferences. The question was asked about the um, Human Rights Commission and to clarify for the honorable member, the constitution requires a Human Rights Commission. The commissions is the name, the title. The commissioners when appointed make the decisions of the commission under the mandate of the constitution the second is the, that lends technical and advisory support to the commissioners. But in addition to that, the Human Rights Commission, 
that is the body, also has responsibility to be the secretariat for the core functions, C-O-R-E functions, of the three human rights bodies, women and gender, rights to child and indigenous people. We have to remember that we're a small country with limited human resources. And so in the constitutional reform, it was thought to be important to make it as practical as possible that the Human Rights Commission Secretariat would be the one to assist the other commissions with regards to their core functions, such as accounting, administration, transportation, etc. But their functions relating to, relating to their mandate in the Constitution is strictly for the commissioners. The other four, four commissions are functioning. We appointed, we announced that the Ethnic Relations Commission was reappointed um, in 2022 and is functioning. And that the gap, as was pointed out, between 2021 and 2022, um, they could not make decisions. They received reports. But again, it's a constitution that demands that the commissioners make the decision and not the technical persons in regarding to how to treat with a case once the investigation is over. That's a decision purely for the commissioners. However, we wish to add that the annual reports of the all these bodies are tabled in the National Assembly and are public documents and posted on their websites so that one can look at the most recent reports of the Indigenous Peoples Commission, the Rights of the Child Commission, Women and Gender, and Ethnic Relations. The question was asked whether the PCA is authorized to deal with cases of abuse, et cetera, brought by persons with LGB, who are LGBTQI. The Police Complaints Authority, under the law, the Com Police Complaints Authority Act, must hear, must investigate all claims by anyone with regarding abuses by the police, corruption, fraud, murder, et cetera. So there's no, nothing that allows the Police Complaints Authority to discriminate against any persons making complaints. So members of the LGBTQI community are free to, as every other citizen of Guyana, to make a complaint to the Police Complaints Authority regarding any abuse by any police officer, any part of the country for the Police Complaints Authority to investigate. We also wish to, to just uh, strengthen that, but that the Police Complaints Authority to ensure has to ensure independence and impartiality in its work. It does not fall within the ambit of the Ghana Police Force. It, the program of the PCA is not financed by the Ghana Police Force. The chairman of the commission is appointed by the president and must be a person who was a retired judge or equivalent of such qualifications. The issue of the status of governance reference domestic legislation. As has been pointed out by you, by one of the members of the committee and ourselves, Article 39.2 of the Constitution allows the High Court to take note and apply international law, including the ICCPR and decisions of the Human Rights Committee. And we have a number of cases in the, the Tyrone Thomas versus the Attorney General of Guyana, uh, Chief Justice Roxanne George noted that Guyana is bound by the ICCPR in coming to a decision that the rights of the claimant in that case under the constitution, the ICCPR were violated. Additionally, the Chief Justice noted various decisions of the UN Human Rights Committee in interpreting and implying and applying the ICCPR and its provisions. Specifically, the Committee on Communication Number 265-1987, uh, A. Fourlane versus Finland was specifically cited. We can send this and other relevant decisions in due course during the review. 
the issue was raised about how do we centralize and and uh, move forward the recommendations of the right of the UN committees or the other treaty bodies we have us we have ratified. We have reported both today and in our report of 2021 the formation of the national mechanism for reporting and follow up, which is made up of 16 agencies that are responsible for examining the recommendations and observations by the various treaty bodies. We also have to train the members of the focal points who are representing those 16 agencies regarding the human rights conventions that Ghana has ratified. That training has taken place in 2022, 2021, with the assistance of the um, Universal Periodic Re uh, Review Trust Fund and what was called the Georgetown Conference, where members of the, of the NMFRFU were exposed to the Convention on the Elimination for Racial Discrimination and um, the CEDAW. We ourselves as a committee continue training on the various conventions with the NMRFU, as well as the um, development of a template of how we bring those recommendations to the attention of the various ministers, cabinet, and the president. The, so they, we have also reported to the UN, we made a presentation in Geneva last year on our mechanism, and we participated in Barbados with another program with the UN regarding the national mechanism. So the, this mechanism is unique in the sense that this is how we as a small developing country with limited human resources are trying to keep up to date with one, the reporting on our treaty obligations and two, the follow-up and monitoring of the implementation of the recommendations. And also being able as a member state to be able to say that some things are not feasible at this time based on a number of uh, objective factors, as well as in some cases, cultural and other um, views that may hamper the implementation of some rights. I hope that I have been able to, to answer some of these issues and clearly we have additional information that in terms of data that we can provide um, to the committee and we can send out um, to you. Muchas gracias, señora jefa de delegación. Y muchas gracias a la, a la delegación por las respuestas que fueron suministradas. Eh, concluimos esta parte del diálogo durante esta tarde. Eh, nos volvemos a encontrar mañana a las 15 horas de Ginebra, hasta las 17 horas. Avanzaremos con las cuestiones 9 a 17. Así que agradecemos el enorme esfuerzo eh, de, de la delegación a distancia, la delegación aquí presente, de los miembros del comité, del servicio de conferencias, del equipo de interpretación y de la secretaría en la persona de la señora Hapton aquí a mi derecha. Así que eh, concluimos por hoy la sesión 4097, la reunión 4097 del comité. Thank you very much.